let's start this and we're just gonna just be rattling on about what this and that how about that uh, All right. hey there wait hold on there was some Oh, did you wait, fart? You were no, farting no. on me all day playing horse yesterday. <laughs> I know. <laughs> who do, who no, does I, heard, that? I heard some interference. Hold on. Hey there. Welcome to Motorcycles and Misfits here at the Recycle Garage in sunny Santa Cruz, California, and Marina, and Alameda. Did I, and is that it? Yeah. Those, all those places. Pretty much. And and another location. And we are later. all in the U.S. of A, darling. Uh, happy Fourth of July weekend, everyone. I hope you guys had some fun. Happy America. It was uh, it was different this year, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I know. At least out here in California, almost all of the fireworks shows were canceled. However, not, not nothing, the one in my neighborhood. Nothing new here because <laughs> in yeah. Santa Cruz, fireworks are illegal and we don't have a fireworks show. Our 4th of July is in October. And I know. Our 4th of July was last night in our downtown, man. It's it was all over down town. here last night. Yeah, it was like the loudest I'd heard in a while. Yeah, it was, it was a noise show. I would um, like to add something, if I may. Is no, that, you're British. We beat you. This is 4th of yes, July episode. No, you did. So you're not allowed. Yeah, yeah. But... Um, you know, I wouldn't want anyone to ever think that the friendships in the Misfits are something that we affect for the show. I actually spent the 4th of July with Jim and Liza and Jim's lovely girlfriend, and I had a wonderful time. We were at a very charming garden party and um, barbecue pork and crab legs, which I didn't indulge in, and booze. More from me. Yeah, and it was uh, it was a wonderful time. Yeah, so, so we are actually, actually we are, we are all friends. We don't put it on for the benefits of our listeners. <laughs> I know I felt a bit of a scoff law having a get together, but your rager the rager party across the street made me feel better about our no, little, we might, little no, garden we party. Were smart, we were smart about it. We maintained our distance. We did. Well, we were outside, and the garden was the uh, old converted flat track from the Taintmas party a couple of years ago oh yeah but, true, true. Uh, memories there was a lot of ways it was different and um a couple of them so one of our traditions on fourth of july is to go to uh hollister to go dirt biking and to yep. go to uh corbin for the hollister uh rally yeah um, oh. they have the big hollister rally in town but at mike corbin's shop it's like a smaller version of it contained but he usually has stunt riders and vendors and food and all the things. Well, it, it was it was weird. It was weird. Did you um, end up going? Did all those things and and did not stay at any of those things. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll share. So Jim and I went dirt biking <clears throat> as we do. Mm -hmm. And Jim, things were different this time, weren't they? Yeah, it was. The, um, <clears throat> yeah, we know that they had a few different reasons. They had already limited the parking since the COVID came in. Um, so it was probably half the cars that would be there normally. And it's always quiet on 4th of July, although I always panic. I'm like, Liza, we got to get there early. She's like, no one's ever there. <laughs> Every time. So we got there mid-morning and not, hardly anyone was there. Um, but yeah, you have to, you know, they, they limit the numbers. There's the parking spaces are marked out in like in the dirt lots and the camping areas. But I swear to God, we were ready to turn around in the first 30 seconds we pulled in the lot. Why? Fucking quads, dude. We we saw like children. 30 quads. No. Children and <sighs> quads. And more quads and more children. Here's the but, thing. One of the things I love when we go to Hollister is seeing families there. Seeing young people being exposed to dirt biking, which you know will be create bikers. A lot of them will. Yeah. But that's usually you have a family and you're they're being, you know, taught the rules and the road and all this stuff. This was not it because a lot of families showed up with their kids and quads and just let them go loose. And it yeah, was, it was like, a shit show. it was a complete <clears throat> shit show. Um, I, which again, I feel bad when it's families, but like even just in the parking lot, they kept forming clusters in the middle of the road and doing like dusty, you know, tire spins and like, yeah. 
you couldn't even anyway, just yeah. get through the drive in the parking lot without having to like encounter children and dust. I, I wonder how much of that is just from being pent up for three months inside without you know, being able to get no, out. Squad, quad, quads are fucktards, dude. They just always are. There's just more of them now for whatever right. reason. There were, but there were, now, now they've been pent up for three months. That's, that's what uh, I'm saying. There were yeah, more, more too. children on quads there than there were adults on dirt bikes that I saw. Oh, that's wild. It was like, I saw like at least 30 quads. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing Maybe is, the parents no figure, the quad. Yeah. if they hurt yeah, themselves, it, then they'll stay still longer when they're in the house. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. But I think, you know, the opposite kind of because like with dirt bikes, you know, you crash and eat shit and it hurts and you learn from that. So I think kids who, that ride dirt bikes, there's a discipline involved, right? Um, yeah, where any, any idiot can get on a quad and do donuts and kick up a dust storm. And you're like, that's rad. I equate it to giving a young child like uh, their first like 22 rifle and teaching them the code of gun safety mm -hmm. and, and maintenance versus giving a kid a BB gun and just letting him go loose in the neighborhood. What could yeah, possibly go wrong? Right? A recipe for disaster. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so right away we were like, oh, not looking good. <laughs> yeah. 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 It did suck the fun out of it. But what we also decided to park, we normally park in the day lot where people don't loiter so much and people just go ride and then bounce. So we decided to park in the shade in the camping areas because there were such less people. And we pulled, oh, this is, so we found a spot, all these families around. We didn't think it was going to be that bad, but it ended up being just like, <laughs> like chaos central. And, it was still yeah. funny, but after a while, it just gets, what gets old is when, you know, kids do a U-turn in front of you and things like that, which happen. So that takes the fun out of it real fast when you almost T-bone a little kid, you yeah. know, doing 15 or 20 yeah, The situational hour. awareness isn't there. It's kind of like putting a dog on a quad, right? They're like. <laughs> no, a dog would be better. I would prefer a dog. <laughs> right. Yeah. At least you could throw a stick and they'll follow. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then we set off on to the trails and right away right away I was not having fun um, and that was because it was dry it was um, really soft like sand and dirt in a lot of places um, and my little bike my I took the little 250 I just didn't feel comfortable it felt like I was riding on a on flat tires it kept kind of tracking left and right and I'm talking That's about front good. wheel it like it wasn't good dirt, you know, after like, like three days after a rain, you have good dirt, it's sticky and you can slide it around, but you get quick traction. This was not it. It was just all loose and dry. And just like yeah, silk. definitely not, definitely not the chocolate cake you get in the wintertime, but yeah, it was like hard packed dirt and then there'll be like loose sand on top of hard packed dirt and then, you know, dry ruts and just typical, but it's getting ridden so much this time of year. It's a lot of stuff's cratered. So you'll come into a series of nice, you know, nice smooth whoops or little jumps. It's not like I really jumped. You get a little bit of air, and it's like woohoo! Except on those, you, you go off the top, and then there's just a massive crater in the bottom. You know, just literally like a <laughs> like a rectangular coffin. Mm. Um, which, and, I, and if you're a better writer, it's it's not a big deal. But I suck, so it is a bigger deal. But um, yeah, it was just it was just dry, and I don't know. It was just weird. So we had a, got a we, weird vibe. We got like to the beginning, like we rode up to go ride a trail, and we get to there, and I'm like, yeah, I'm done. I'm going. <laughs> I'm leaving. <laughs> I was like, I'm done. I don't like well, we the realized, <clears throat> I don't like the quads. I don't like my bike. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. Well, that bike, I, I think we figured it out. You know, you like the heavier bikes that more, are more like tractors. You know, the 250 yeah. is a lighter, squirrely, squirrely bike. And, you know, tires are at 15 pounds. But you do most of your riding sitting down. And when we get into the loose stuff, you just can't sit down. So I hopped on your bike, too. And we have the same bike, more or less. But I had a, I've upgraded the suspension, so it's and taller the, from that. The same tires. Yeah, same tires. Um, uh, and then, you know, I had the bar risers with rental mm -hmm. fat bars that also gave a little bit. So my bike is a lot taller than yours. And I noticed when I got on yours, it was smaller, so you're more compacted. It's harder to get your elbows up. Um, yeah. it is just, it's just small. And, and especially sitting down, it's just that's, it's a tough way to get to ride. So. You know, dirt biking has gotten me used to the rear wheel moving around, and I'm comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with the front wheel moving around. And that's what was mm. happening. Yeah. Well, the, the reason is, is you're, you're sitting down a lot of the time. Right. And a lot of the, when, when we're in the loose stuff, whether it's rocks or sand or gravel or whatever, you know, you got to get up and you got to, you know, up on the, up on the pegs and your weight back a little bit and take the, take the front wheel out of place. So to speak. Right. Yeah. Are you able to shift your weight back <laughs> more to take, take more weight off the front wheel? 
I could, but I was actually, I think I was riding up front because you, you know, that's how you're taught to ride up on the seat. So you do have traction mm -hmm. on the front wheel. And, and plus Lysa has got <clears throat> terrible knees. So you're not right. going to spend much of your time standing up anyway. Yeah, I can't. So yeah, I just, right. I right away, I'm like, you know what? I'm done, but that's okay. Because Jim, you go ahead and keep riding. You do your thing. You're used to riding by yourself. I said, I'm going to go ride my bike because it's plated. I'm going to go ride across town over to Corbin for the, for the, you know, the festival. Um, so here's the deal. So the Hollister rally, which has been going on for decades, right? Yep, good um, deal. They announced this year because of COVID that it would be canceled. <clears throat> but then Mike Corbin said, but don't worry because we're not canceling. We're still going to be doing our thing. Right. Come on out to the Corbin factory, right? And that was the last conversation I had with him maybe a month ago. Right. So, um, so I head on over there thinking it's, it's going to be crowds, which I was a bit uncomfortable with. Jim had said he had no interest in going, but I said, I really want to see what events look like from here on. Like, I want to know how this works and what it's like. And can, it, can I have fun or am I just right. going to feel like Ooh, the whole time, yeah. you know? Um, so I went, I rode over there and I was surprised to see no tents, no nothing, about 20 bikes parked out in front, which is what you might find on any Saturday when you go there. Uh, I know we've talked about the Corman factory quite a lot. Uh, it's big and it has a 50s diner. So it's got a restaurant. So it'd be, it's a destination for a lot of rides. That's Wizards Cafe there. to you, the Wizards Cafe. And bike ha uh, Mike has a bunch of uh, bikes in his showroom. So it's, um, it's a cool place just to stop in. It's not just, you know, a factory. Um, the Wizards Workshop. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but I did, when I pulled up, I found some of uh, my friends, uh, R1 Rich, and his gang was there. And they were all standing around looking confused, too. Oh, R uh, R1 Rich was on his brand new R1 which looks exactly like his last R1. <laughs> he loves you know, if you R1s. go by the name of R1 Rich and you ride around on a Kawasaki, that yeah, would be kind of not a bright thing, would it? So I'm glad he got another R1. Yes. Um, and they were all looking confused too because they had planned a group ride out there. So um, I went in and... The, the cafe was open and, and there were people in there getting seats made. And then I saw Mike, he was talking to somebody in the showroom and he saw me and he waved and um, talked to him and uh, kind of got the scoop. I believe uh, he intended to have everything, but the city put the kibosh on that. I think they wouldn't give any permits for any of that. Wow. So he just was open for business like he would be on any weekend that's all he could do because yeah, it's also just just you know it's also a huge financial burden on the city to pull all the security and police and all that kind of stuff so it's probably more than than just the covid oh yeah I mean, I mean, it's a big deal for all of us it'd, it'd be the easiest thing for everyone to jump on the bandwagon and go oh boo you know hollister city government blah 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 but it costs them a great deal of money to, to put on the rally. And I think they've lost a lot of money every year doing it. No, but and I'm I, talking, but not at Mike Corbin. I mean, that's his, uh, well, private, that's his private thing. Right. But yeah, it's, it's but also that, that, you know, the city's I, got, I know. think it was the COVID safety. They didn't want to have no, no large gatherings. I got no problem with that. So the fact that he was still open was very nice. And I think he was disappointed because he wanted to have something too. He was there, he had his mask on, everyone had their masks on. Um, half of the booths in the cafe were, you know, closed off. Um, the workers were making seats, uh, but he took me into his R&D department to show me some cool stuff that they're working on. Oh yeah? And yeah, he showed me his uh, 2020 Triumph Rocket 3. Hey hmm. Jim, you're making a lot of racket just so you know. Oh, sorry. I thought I had my microphone muted. Yes. I'll mute it now. <laughs> sorry about that. 
I'm um, putting new Spock. I'm putting new Spock. I know. In the I know. You'd love to work S while we're doing this. Sprock away, yes. I'm, I'm now. It was like two hours. I could do a lot of shit in two hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he had his brand new Triumph Rocket Three. I am. I showed you pictures of the bike. Oh it's God, it's beautiful. Good looking bike. That, it's, oh, it's crushingly um, handsome. I'm gonna say it's in the same family as the V Max and the Diavel. Hmm. So a power cruiser. Nice. I think if it was a man. It could easily beat up Chuck Norris with a British accent. <laughs> easily. It's that thought, kind of bike. I thought, Emma, you had a nice comment about it looking like a locomotive. Well, you know, when bikes get to a certain size and a certain stature, there's, there's, there's a certain locomotive element about them. And that yes. Rocket 3, if you look at the back shaft drive, it looks like it's off a frigging train. <laughs> and it's probably the same scale as on a train as well. I mean, they're big bikes. They've been big bikes for like 25, 30 years, you know, Jeez. but wow, they're big. Yeah. And so he showed me his. No, that's it. Show, the other for. picture, Liza. The other picture. That yeah. Looks... Look at that back end. Oh, yeah. It's that's got like a. The, <laughs> the, the, it looks like a 250 rear wheel. Yeah. Um, it's big. But he, um, they, you know, made a Corbin seat for it. Now he's making um, bags for it, which are really cool because he's got all these different contours. So it actually matches contours on the tank and will paint up like the tank to match. Cool. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then, you know what I didn't get? Uh, it's not in the picture. There was an Africa twin there with a beautiful red, silver, and blue seat. Oh, I think I have to go get one now. Mm. And it matches, matched my color scheme. But, you nice. know, um, Corbin have always done this. They, if you get color-matched Corbin saddlebags, particularly on the cruisers, they, he absolutely nails the lines of the bike. And oh, yeah. the color's perfect every time. It looks like it came with the bike. Right. The, what Except they, what in they a designed. lot of ways, it, it's heavier quality than the OEM stuff. Well, and that's why, I mean, uh, Corbin, in fact, people know him for the seats, but... They do some of the best um, uh, fiberglass uh, molds and all that, right? Right. They're and some of the best. It's super heavy stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. you could throw a Corbin equipped bike down the road. Now, I don't think you'd, you could probably grind away some of the saddlebag, but you're not going to smash it. There's nice features too. You can get the heated seat, the cooled seat. Yeah. Um, yeah. And basically the whole custom thing, right? They basically have two guys that make every seat and they've done it for probably 20 or 30 or 40 years. Right. That yeah. green commando I built for the museum, the seat was actually custom made to my butt. And the problem is I've lost about 20 pounds since then, so it doesn't fit me anymore. <laughs> As for a fat Emma. And I'm a thin Emma you know, now. One of the things, I don't know if we've ever mentioned about it, when you go there and you go to where all the sewing machines are, and um, they have plaques on the wall for years of service, I don't think there's one less than 20 years. And oh, there's yeah. a bunch at like 30 plus. It's amazing. And the girls yeah, are great. Because you go in there and the girls are all made up to the nines and they've got like giant hoop earrings on and lots of jewelry <laughs> and they're all like, hey, it's good to see you. It's great. It's, it's a neat scene there. It is. Yeah. It is. But again, it wasn't the same. It was something. Yeah. It's just another, you know, casualty of COVID, I'll say. <clears throat> yep. Um. So it was nice to just go there and, and talk to Mike about when we talked about the industry and stuff like that. They're, they're doing great, by the way. He's doing great with seat service. <clears throat> nice. Um, but so that was two, two things that just like that we do every year. I'm like, mm, I just want things to go back to normal. But I don't know. Will they ever? I don't know. What do you guys That's think? The well, they'll yeah. they'll come into a new normal. You know, it's it's we're in an inter interstitial stage right now where <clears throat> the old normal is no longer no longer applies, <clears throat> and we're trying to just get by with what we're doing right now, just to you know stay safe. Yeah, I I mean I'm I'm being very optimistic about it. I think when we're finally through this, it's going to be absolutely brilliant. Because people are going to have a slightly new perspective, and hopefully they've figured out what's important. And 
in a lot of cases, you know, just chasing money isn't as important mm -hmm. as doing fun things like hanging out with people you like and riding, like riding friggin' motorbikes. I'm hoping that, you know, by us um, giving up so much and sacrificing so much, you know, um, to try and be safe because of COVID, that when we do get through the other side, we can make up for it. Like maybe AMA Vintage Days will be naked and have free beer. Oh yeah. Like, like wouldn't that be cool? That. All nude free beer? Woohoo! We maybe. will more than make up for it. Can, can you make for the unsee two... button? Unsee, unsee. <laughs> or, or what about make it two weeks long just to make up for, you know. Ah, oh, dude, time. man. <laughs> I like that. I do. Jim, would you go I was to... thinking about your whole bent toward ADV bikes and Jim and, and Liza, which you were talking about last weekend. And you know, there's your physical distancing, which you're going out yeah. doing something away from a screen, having fun, even though it's not with big <clears> bunches of people. Yeah, you know, the only, and I think you're right, Scott, and the only concern you have to keep in mind, because that's what they'll tell you when you go to remote areas, is mm -hmm. they have very limited resources. So if you do have an accident, you know, or have a bad day, Absolutely. Um, you, could, you could really be, you know, not, not have medical help really available. So just something mm -hmm. to keep in mind. But yeah, I, I think I agree. Great social distancing. So, and as I said, um, one of the things that I just didn't enjoy, I just didn't feel comfortable on that bike in that um, that dry terrain and because we're about to set out and go do this epic trip and ride in places like Utah <laughs> where Desert. we could expect that same terrain I decided I'm going to take the KLR instead on the trip um, mm -hmm. I think I'll just be more comfortable but it did get me thinking and Jim is the one like right away he's like you need to sell that bike <laughs> the 250 well yeah I'll I'll, I'll tell you when I, there was a defining moment. We just come out. We just took some whatever the e, one of the easy trails up and made a U-turn and basically came back down. And yeah, it was yeah. a downhill. Downhill with just some gentle whoops as you get down. Then a, a, a right-hand kind of U-turn down in some more sandy stuff. Yeah. And I thought you were about to duck walk down. I looked at you and you were <laughs> super tight. Your asshole was whistling Dixie. Like, I <laughs> was terrified. I was like, oh my God, she needs to get rid of that bike. She is not, I know when you're riding well in the dirt, you, you don't enjoy it. You're, you go into that weird trancey stake. And, um, and when you're not riding well in the dirt, you just, it just didn't look fun. So I don't mean to pick on you, but no, you know, that's know. not fun. Being fucking scared sucks, you know, and it's, um, and that's why I don't do some stuff too. So let's, just, let, yeah, let's put it, yeah. let's put it out there, Liza. Are you going to ditch the CRF? So this is something I'm starting to think about now that if I ditch the CRF, so my plan was to have three off-road bikes, the big one, the after yes. the twin, the medium, the KLR, yes. and then the small one to do like dirt biking at Hollister, that kind of stuff. But I just, it feels like the bike is too small on me. I sold you that bike. Yeah. I'm crushed. Uh, if you Mama get bear, rid of it. Bear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, but if you get rid of it, I'll be crushed. No, you won't. So, I think you should get rid of it. Um, <laughs> so it's like abandoning an adopted child, Liza. I you know, I saw like, the triumph she worked on, and she didn't break her heart. So I go. think maybe okay. Oh, well, do, maybe it did, Scott. Maybe it did. Sorry. I just wear it well. <laughs> you do. I do like a bit heavier bike that feels more stable to me. Mm -hmm. well, um, you know what I will say, Liza? Yeah. Is, um, we last one of the times we went to Hollister, you rode the KLR six fifty. And one of the areas we enjoy, we call it the little playground. So it's just mm -hmm. like drainage, ditch, you know, little drop-offs and through a creek and over logs. And we like to play in there. It's first gear, kind of just tractoring around. You were totally comfortable doing that on the on that bike. And your tires were pretty much bald. Like most of the I know. Tires, but you were like, like you were totally comfortable, having a good time. You were laughing, um, totally having a good time. But, and same on the African <laughs> Twin. The African Twin is just a, it's just a lot more motorcycle. But the 250, I think it, A, ergonomically, it's definitely too small for you. And then B, I just don't think it's fun, you know? So bounce, you know, get rid of it and have some of the others. So some bikes that came to mind that I have ridden. So I used to have the DRZ that I sold because it wasn't a planted bike. And that's why I replaced it with the 250. So maybe a DRZ 400S plated bike. Um, or um, I have ridden the 690 Enduro, the KTM 690 Enduro. And it still feels like a dirt bike. It's just a little bit bigger scale. So that's a possibility. Well, now hang on a minute. You've got it, the DRC 400S. 
And yeah. what would you do? Put seventeen-inch knobbies on it? No, not super, not SM. S. Oh, not the not the Motard, just no, the S. The plated, yeah. Okay, with the pumper carb and the yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's I the could same see thing. That. What I had, it's just uh. Yeah, you just have plated. the option to put plates on it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't. I don't know. I just think the bikes that I, but see, I don't want to judge a bike because it was good terrain. Like my XR two fifty R, my XR three fifty R, I rode great. They were just mules, you know. But um, I, everyone kept telling me, and which it should apply to almost everyone, a smaller, lighter, more maneuverable, flickable bike is what you really want. But that doesn't work for me. For most people, it does. You want your dirt bike as light as possible so you can get out of situations. But I don't like it. <laughs> so have you been on the, the BMW F bikes, like the GS there? No, I wouldn't get an F bike. It's not okay. dirt bike enough. I mean, I already got I, the KLR and an Africa Twin. It, it kind of plays in the same space, but it's probably yeah. in the middle of the road of weight. They're over that way. But. <clears throat> yeah, no. And the, the F650 is actually small for me, too. Well, they've got that eight, uh, F800 or 850GS. And yeah, somebody that's, on a, that's midsize. Keep it yeah. small, mm -hmm. narrow bike yeah. to get in a Hollister or to do small no, stuff. You I think you're on the right track with a KTM, actually. Because, I mean, it'll be gnarly yeah. enough. Um, you know, those things have got gnarly power. So, oh, I know. I mean, that's a beast. That 690 is a beast of a motorcycle. And I, I mean, why, where, why would you ride what? that and not ride the KLR 650? Like, why would, what would be the difference? Oh, two, two different bikes. Well, I, I yeah, get they're that, different but bikes, but I think you'd get enough of a thrill off a 450 KTM. Maybe, but I've ridden. Uh, the point yeah, is, I've know, ridden off-road yeah, yeah, yeah. on the 690, and I've ridden in the DRZ off-road. So these are two bikes that are contenders because I've ridden them and felt comfortable. Yes. Um, <clears throat> whereas the EX350 felt really squirrely, but the 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 K the 690 Enduro didn't. So you should ride know. a 450. You should ride one of the 450s or the fives. Because, you know, that's a good compromise. Because the 690, is as, as different as it is from the KLR, you've still got two larger bikes there. What? Which 450? Which 500? Uh, the KTMs. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. No, they, you should try them. Because they make good power. <clears throat> yeah. I'm a, yeah, I want to I wanna try some different bikes. But... Okay. um. So we'll see, but that's why I like, I like that little, I like that little, I want to love, I want to love the CRF. As Jim and I said, you know, we talked about, you know, when we got the, the CRF and it's an underpowered kind of blah bike, but it will start every time and you cannot kill it. And that was the thing, Jim, we were talking about, I, you know, having a kickstart only bike, not doing that again. I got to have a starter. Having something yeah. that's not always reliable. Not doing that again. I wanted something that was going to start every time. Um, so yeah. and, that's what these bikes are good for. Yeah. And, you know, and the, one of the, the differences between mine and yours is, you know, I put a bunch of money into it, right? Because it is underpowered, under suspension, all that. Um, you know, so I did, you know, do the, the front suspension, new, new spring on the rear. Um, you know, and just the suspension upgrades alone made a huge difference. And then, like I said, the bar risers and the different bars. So it's a much taller bike made it a lot more a lot easier to ride you know not as compact but yeah it's a you know but stock it's it's a it's a great trail bike for someone that's 180 or 80 pounds but for you and i you know stock we crush the suspension yeah. you know it's a little underpowered it is underpowered i mean it's 300 pounds and makes like you know 16 or 17 horsepower so you know versus a ktm that's you know 230 and makes 40 plus horsepower everything i learned at jocelyn's went out the window <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, everything at Jocelyn's for the most part was on hard dirt, you know, basically most of it anyway. Yeah. yeah. And I was completely comfortable on that Africa twin cutting that rear wheel loose and sliding it around. But again, it's when that front wheel, what, you know, that feeling when you have a flat tire and you feel it kind of tracking side to side. Mm -hmm. I was like, I stopped and I'm like, do I have a flat? But it was just, it was finding just the little divots and ruts and just going in them. Or the soft sand. I don't know. Yeah, the other so, thing is you just can't ride in the sand sitting down. So, yeah. So, we'll see. But um, 
speaking of other bikes, Emma and I worked on the KZ400 today. Yeah. Thank you again for your help. It's always nice to have her there. She's so like able to like just pinpoint something very quickly. Though I did discover something about Emma today. Oh. Yes, she oh. has no patience whatsoever. Four. That's not true. She wanted to see that bike run today. And it was just like, <laughs> let's go, let's put it together. Blah, 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 blah. You know, she's just like, I'm like, hold on, hold on. No, oh, I don't talk Let like me that. do Blaza. it. Let me do I it. I go, blah, 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 <laughs> blah, blah, blah. She no, just wanted no, no, to no, 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 get into you, it. You, you, you just back off there, sis. Because yeah. you can't. In one sentence, say she's very focused, and yeah. then say she's got no patience because the two are inextricably linked. I mean, the goal it's called keeping your eye on the prize, darling. And the prize was hearing that thing run. I don't want me to hear it. Run. You were more excited about that than I was. I am in this for the long haul, and I wanted to take my time. And you know, we realized that the uh, pet cock was not passing any gas through it. So it was gummed up. So you were like, hey, just, you wanted to like nice crack it apart. No, no, no. And I'm like, no, no, let me do it. And I wanted to take every single thing apart and clean it. And I just, I'm in it for the long haul. I just wanted to take my- Oh, no, it's very nice. Right. Yes. And you just wanted to get that shit started. I want to hear it. <laughs> are you, you going to share? Are you going to share what color you're going to paint it yet? Poo brown. Yeah, you've gone for the poo brown, haven't you? <laughs> you have gone for the poo brown. Um, you mean root beer, right? So no, Jim, no poo we brown. We didn't start it because um, <laughs> in rebuilding the pet cock, um, the rubber was in such bad condition it just is leaking. It crumbled. It crumbled. I, I, yeah, darling. I have to. I have to do a pet cock rebuild. It I just, crumbled. I just ordered a new one. Like I crumbled when Scott sold that Triumph. It was that crumbly. See, Scott, she got you. <laughs> no, so I gotta, I'm going to be patient. Just put a new pet cock in. Um... So, no, what you should do right now is, is do a reader survey. Do metallic red with so, the yeah. golden black pinstripes. So, all right. So here's the, the goal with this bike. Um, because it's almost all stock, save mm -hmm. for the Mac pipes, which are early period. 80s, period. The period. Um, I've already replaced all the other uh, non-stock stuff like the seat. Um, so th what's left to do is to pick the paint scheme. And I want to, I'm not making a concourse show bike, but I want a, a show bike. If we still had shows like we used to, like the you know, Capitola bike show, that kind of stuff where you just get a bunch of old men standing around saying, oh, I used to have one. That's, <laughs> that's how I want this restored. Yeah. Yeah. The gas station crowd bike. I, I used to ride one of them before I started. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I yeah, had one back in 72. That's funny because they didn't come out till 74. But okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, my memory's <laughs> yeah. not as good as it used to be, you know. So I do. So I have been all the parts I've been buying. You guys would be proud. I have been Stop. buying new old stock. Good Even girl. though a lot of this stuff is on Banggood. Um, and I'm paying, <laughs> like I got a new headlight bucket new old stock um just yeah, i've been buying the more expensive good stuff nice so to choose the paint to repaint it um i want to go with what it would have come in that year and emma looked it up and we have two choices emma you well, want to say more, there? but i'm drawn to the wait you didn't the tell me the other choices no there's more choices but mm. I'm, I'm not interested in them Emma, what are my other choices? Blue. Oh, wait. What, what color blue? What do they call the blue? Well, not dissimilar to your BMW <laughs> that's behind you. Okay. Yeah. But, um, so you've got blue with black and gold graphics, cherry red pearl with blue or gold graphics, or <clears throat> poo brown with <laughs> lime green called. stripes. Oh. Poo brown with lime green. With lime sticks. green. <laughs> oh no. No, just don't. You just stop bagel because poo brown with lime green stripes is the best paint scheme by oh. far. And, and Liza is, has, is actually gravitating towards poo brown right now. And this is a solid brown, not a metallic brown. It's poo That's, brown. 
where I'm like, it has to be sparkly. It has to be sparkly. Because poo is not sparkly. I don't care if you have been eighteen dollars. Glitter. Have you not seen uh, unicorn poo? Well, no, I have not. But this okay. is not. But unicorn poo is not no, brown. Um, it's so, but poo Emma brown did, with lime Emma, green pinstripes. It's brilliant. Emma um, can make the point when it's not a concourse bike. A concourse bike has to be everything. Perfect, it, including your right. your bare frame right. restoration. Then you don't want to go bare frame. I think right. She said right. that. Um, you have the freedom to get a similar color that's more mm -hmm. appealing, and, and it still is is good. Uh, and I mean, there there are parameters. So I'll give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> if your bike was blue, and you paint it teal, you're not right. going to get away with it. Right. But if you your bike was like a cherry red, and you paint it kind of like a scarlety red. You're going to get away with that. Mm -hmm. So I am going to show you on the camera the Pooh Brown. And everyone is going to agree that he's the best paint scheme by far. That blue I put on the Beamer, that's just close to something they've got on similar bikes. And it's just, you know, picked it out in San Leandro color. And the guy's like, that's really expensive blue. So despite what they call it, I'm just calling it expensive blue. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> I decided not to choose my paint color because it cost less. <laughs> All right. Are we ready? Yes. Ready. Are we ready? Okay. Pooh Brown with lime green pinstripes. No. That's nice. That is not brown. That is more of like a. No, it's Pooh Brown. It's no, that's poo like Pooh eating with beets. Lime green and gold pinstripes. And I think that's the best paint scheme. <clears throat> hmm. Interesting. Looks like a burnt orange. No, yeah, it's not a burnt orange. Ooh, can it be burnt? What do they call it? What's Honda call that color? Or oh, call oh, that color? hang on, I found another color. Oh, I, know, oh. I found Ooh. another picture. See, look, it's poo brown. <laughs> <laughs> well, what does Kawi call the color? They always have a name for the color. Poo brown. Root beer poo. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> Vindaloo. <laughs> <laughs> Vindaloo poo. <laughs> and so the other, so hang on, we're not, the poo. With, we're, we're not done with this yet, so we're going to explore, I'm going to show you the blue Liza. Mm. I think Remember that for anyone listening to the podcast, this is not riveting at all. Well, no, Clearly. I don't. Well, they I, can imagine these colors in their mind, I'm sure. Um, so the other nice thing in these different bikes she's showing, they do have different uh, graphics on them, different uh, stripe stick, sticker kits. So she has found a sticker kit, so I can make it look as close to and this as is, possible this is the key because you can you can take all kinds of leeway you know and all kinds of liberties with the color um but you really need to put the oem graphics on it to get the the, right. the complete effect so there's the blue which is quite appealing mm, that is nice and you can see it's got Ooh. a broad black stripe on the top and a gold on the bottom but I think if you don't paint it brown, you're missing out. Well, I think that, that burnt orange looks the nicest with the green stripe. Poo brown. Well, there you go. Well, I, I we'll see. I will continue talking about it. But going back to it being 4th of July, um, you know, another thing I wanted to talk about uh, this weekend, it really got me thinking about the all-American motorcycle family yes. can you guys name like if you think of like the the davidsons right that would be all american motorcycle family uh can you think of any other the knievels yeah the knievels. 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 exactly of course where you have knievels. generations who've contributed and made their mark but there's another family that's made a huge mark on motorcycling in america that we know today and i wanted to talk about the pentons oh yeah now you may not have heard of the Pentons, but you're about to learn about why they're so amazing. You got, uh, let's see, you got John, Jeff, Jack, Tom. Well, you, just before, John is the, really the patriarch. Well, although gonna, his dad was a motorbiker. We're going to get into him, but to talk about it, I thought we'd bring someone on who knows a lot about the Pentons. That would be good. And so joining us we've got todd huffman hey todd how you doing what's up kids how are you hey hey, hey. hey. Hello, todd. what's happening todd <laughs> welcome 
So Thank you. Todd, uh, you're the director, producer. Are you also the writer? Writer, fundraiser. <laughs> you you <laughs> made a film. You made a film called yeah. Penton, the John Penton story. And um, this is something that I actually, I don't know where I got it, but I have a copy of it. And I watched it. I loved it because this was a story I didn't know. And I couldn't believe how much of John Penton's story related to writing as I know today. And then I shared it with, with Jim because I'm like, oh, my God, this is yeah, such an amazing it was a, story. Uh, when you started going through, like, must-see mo motorcycle movies, it's like on any Sunday, hitting the apex and the John Penton story. Right. So um, I reached out to Todd because I remembered that film. And I said, hey, Todd, I would love to have you submit your film for – uh, the film festival I'm putting together, the Black Hills Moto Film Festival. And Todd, you said yes, and I am so happy. So it is something that is going to be in the uh, Black Hills Moto Film Festival, which, just a reminder, August 14th through 16th, go to revsisters.com and get your free tickets. Uh, because we're all going to up for one weekend for you to see. Um, but Todd, I wanted to thank you. And I let's uh, let's get into the John Penton story. Yeah. And, and, and tell everyone why they're so amazing. I guess the first question is, how did you choose John Penton and the Penton family to do a movie on? Well, I like to, the easiest way for me to describe John Penton to people is, you know, he's like the Forrest Gump of dirt bikes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'd call him that. <laughs> well, you, yeah, I'm sure you can get away with it. I don't think I, I'd refer to him that way. Well, and the only reason I say that is because it seemed like he was around anything of importance that happened in the world. Yeah. Oh, how funny. Yeah, totally. You know, I mean, his, his, uh, he touched just about every facet of it. And uh, I had uh, produced a series of TV episodes called a show called The Motocross Files. Yes. Uh, for for the, uh, the Speed Channel. And so we were shooting these dirt bike documentaries about these motocross guys and... I had grown up as a, just a dirt bike kid in the seventies up in Northern California um, and knew of the Pentons and uh, Carl Crank, who uh, was a famous Penton team rider uh, who lived up near, near, near me. And so we would read about the Pentons in the, you know, magazines and dirt oh, yeah. and cycle news and everything. So I knew who the Pentons were and, uh, but I picked up on the way to the indie trade show. I think it was like an 05 or 06. I'd gotten a copy of Ed Youngblood's book, uh, John Penton and the Off-Road Motorcycle Revolution. And uh, I read that thing on the, from LA to Indianapolis, cover to cover on the plane. And I was just like, wow, this is a really interesting story. And not so much the motorcycle stuff, which I, you know, I learned a lot um, from that, but I really liked the family stuff. Yeah. And, uh, I really felt it was a family story, a American story, an entrepreneur story. <laughs> and it really could have been about any product, any industry. It just so happened that they rode motorcycles, you know? So that's and, what kind of attracted me to it and started the process. <clears throat> we haven't even said what era. So um, John Penton, um, let's see, this was in the, like the forties, right? This is when he was really getting into it. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, he uh, discovered uh, motorcycling after he came back from World War II because yeah. um, uh, his brothers were kind of into it and the, the famous Jack Pine Enduro up in Upper uh, yes. Michigan. And uh, so they got together some old beat up Harleys and started racing that thing and wanted to make the motorcycles more competitive so they could win. And they upgraded the BSAs and and then they started selling the BSAs and Next thing you know, you know, John's getting invited to race in in Europe for the international six days trial, and uh, kind of the rest is history. Because on one of those trips is where he met the folks from ATM <laughs> in Austria. So right. So uh, a couple of the things that I really love about this film is first of all, you are extremely thorough. <laughs> like you have like Maybe secretaries and like people just like peripheral people in the, the world of the pendants who may come in and just say like one line or something, but it, 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 it meant something like you were very thorough. I can't believe how many of these people you dug up. Yeah. You know, we had over a hundred interviews in the movie. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, because, it, you know, because <laughs> Johnny, you know, he turns 95 this uh, August. He's still around. Oh, yeah. John is still uh, literally kicking and walking and doing his thing and tending to his orchards. And, you know, he walks every day in KTM's warehouse just for some exercise. And, and uh, so, yeah. Um, so his story, you know, it spans, you know, over a hundred years, you know, um, with his, yeah. his dad and uh, his uh, grandfather working for Henry Ford and all this stuff, you know, so uh, we had a lot of people to cover and, you know, John's contemporaries as a 90 year old man. And then of course the later generations of the famous Penton sons, you know, Tom, Jack and Jeff, mm -hmm. and of course fellow competitors. And it's just, Oh, let's go ahead, many, but, go ahead and drop, uh, drop some names right now. Oh, I don't know. Um, uh, you know, guys like Brad Lackey and uh, um, God, you're putting me on the spot. You know, Marty well, Smith, a bunch of motocross guys. Lyle Lovett. <laughs> well, Lyle Lovett, yeah, Lyle yeah. Lovett, generator, right? So, you know, Lyle used to, you know, race a Penton as a kid in Texas. So um, I knew, knew of him as a, motor, a, a dirt bike guy and uh, you know, out of the blue one night, a stranger from Texas and an attorney who's a dirt bike fan just sent me an email or called me and said, hey, you should do a movie about John Penton and have Lyle Lovett narrate it. And I was like, oh, that's a good idea because I was already thinking of doing the movie. In fact, I'd already shot some interviews with John. And so a friend of ours, uh, Mark Blackwell, who was a, the head of Indian Motorcycles and Polaris for a while and and uh, is now a consultant. He, I knew he was friends with Lyle. And uh, I called Lyle. I called Mark. I said, hey, you think Lyle would narrate our movie about John Fenton? An hour later, Mark calls back and says, Todd, he'd be honored to do it. And you know? let's say why. Because he has a direct relation. Yeah. And, you know, Lyle likes his connection to the dirt bike. He's a dirt biker at heart, you know. And, uh, yeah. And uh, so he rode a Penton motorcycle in the early 70s as a kid while he was learning how to play that damn guitar um, <laughs> out of Houston, Texas. And he rode for a, a dirt bike shop down there that sold uh, pens. Was it Cycle Texas. Shack, I think, in the Texas? Cycle Shack, yeah. yeah. And Lyle even actually worked in the store as a kid sweeping the floors for no pay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so he, I, yeah, I didn't know Lyle love it. Big, big dirt biker. So, yeah, so, what, so, what you're say, biker. so what you're saying is that Lyle love it ended up uh, going into his side hobby as a career? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. I think his parents kept him uh, on the music track all along the dirt bike. Yeah. Okay. In fact, he rode for a, um, his sponsor at the time was H and H Music, was a music store in Houston, Texas. No way. Wow, fun. Yeah, cool. and he was by far not the fastest rider on the team. You know, so. Um, well, and but, and also Malcolm Smith, you got him in there too. Got Malcolm in there. Of course, Malcolm was with John on yeah. the trip when he met when he went to the KTM factory coming back from the 1967 six days in Poland, you know, uh, Malcolm, you know, tells a story in the, in the movie that, you know, John was always one of these guys talking about big ideas. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And Malcolm's like, yeah, all right, John, whatever you say. And he stopped by the factory on the way back from Poland. And, and John didn't actually get to talk to somebody there, but um, the guys there, had said that, hey, the, bo the big boss is at the trade show in Italy, in Milan. And uh, that's where there is, you have to come back. Well, as soon as John got home, back to America, he got back on an airplane to Milan, Italy to go meet with those guys. And, so, you know. it's, so, it's such a great story. I wanna talk a little bit though about uh, John and some of his amazing feats. Emma, we were watching the movie again today in the garage. We were. It was... You want to share like some of the amazing things? <laughs> well, I mean, just the thing that came across for me, and I think that dovetails into the fact that he's still with us at 95 years old, is just his sheer bloody determination. Yeah. And that's the thing that really comes through in the movie, is that you know, gashing your face open on a fence. You, and you just read riding, my mind. carrying on riding. And then <laughs> well, all the people it... at the checkpoint say, dude, you need to stop right now. You're just covered in blood. And John well, says, oh, it's, movie. it's frozen oh, yeah. onto my face now. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, it just ran right off. 
Yeah, that's the scene dark. I think about when I think about this movie. And that's why I'm like, that dude is so hardcore. That it's shot dark. of him rolling up to the checkpoint and his face is just split open. He's all, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, and all the people at the checkpoint, you're not good. You are not good. Oh, awesome. Great, yeah, I, that was such a fun movie to watch. I tell you, it was such kind of a sleeper because you're like, oh, okay, Dirt Mike movie, whatever. But it was engaging from the beginning. And the history, you know, from riding those big heavy bikes in the sand, even you know, in the woods yeah. in Michigan, yeah. transitioning to the lightweight European bikes. What a, It was just a fascinating um, part of motocross history. I, I do have a question for you a little bit about the whole process of making the film. Because um, it, it, it's a very well-made film. And there's obviously a certain amount of money involved in making a film like that. So you start off with an idea. I want to do a story of John Penton. And you've obviously got some clout as a filmmaker. What do you do then? So you've got this idea. Do you get a few interviews in the bag? So when you go and talk to the investors, you say, well, this is what I've got so far. Or do you just go there with the idea and say, I need some money to make this thing? Yeah, you know, I, I would love to think that I can just go to investors and show them a resume or show them some clips and say they'll roll over and their wallets will open, you know. And, and, but for us, it doesn't work like that. And you guys might know in the motorcycle industry is not, you know, up for spending, you know. No, uh, notoriously tight, darling. I've been in the motorbike industry for 40 years and there's, yeah. there's very few industries that they're tighter with their purse springs. Load it, you know, load to mid six figures, you know, to make something like this, you know, and I think our budget right. for the pet movie was almost $400,000 to make that. Wow. So, I don't know. I guess in our world, that's real money, you know. Um, it's and, a chunk but, of change. I mean, I know by film standards, it's not a great amount. And I think it's a testament to your skill that a product like that came out with such a small bu- budget. Yeah, and when we did it, um, nothing really happened until we got Lyle Lovett to say yes. And mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, well, we can sell that because he's a star. Right. And we have some star power, you know. Um, so we actually went out and shot a little teaser. I don't think you can even find it online. I should put it back online because it's really cool. That is just, it was all done in one shot. And we found a little place in the woods and Magic Hour and and we use a little bit of Lyle's music and it's just a headlight coming from far away down through the woods. And Lyle does this little voiceover about, you know, um, uh, a man, you know, got together his band of, you know, uh, confidants to put this little company together and change the world basically. was the, but yeah. At the end, the motorcycle comes right up full frame, right? We t- we stages to where it starts at the beginning of this little monologue by Lyle with the music and it's just a headlight snaking through the woods right and at the end he comes right up to the camera and it's a he's and it's a friend of mine dressed as John Penton in his helmet and on a Penton and whatever and he drives and just drives he he stops looks away doesn't even look at the camera drives away right so we built that and we thought okay we can fundraise with this well no (laughs) And then I was talking with a friend of mine and he had mentioned this thing called Kickstarter, you know, was coming on. Oh, you should try this thing called Kickstarter. So we tried it at first for like, I think we had the first time we tried it for like $250,000 and it didn't make the, in 60 days or in 30 days, it didn't do, it failed, right? It didn't reach the goal. I think we got like $70,000 or something. And so I waited about six months and I put it back up at like $150,000 because I'm like, okay, well, let's just say we can get it in the can. Let's get it shot. You know, worry about editing it later and, uh, and, and put it out for 60 days, which is the maximum for Kickstarter. And it worked this time. You know, we actually went over, uh, fantastic. So we got like $165,000 through 562 backers for it. And, uh, I remember watching it count down. I was in a bar in downtown Fullerton area where I live. And the way Kickstarter works, you can, you can watch it count down to the deadline. Right. <laughs> and I'm sitting there with a friend and I watch it count down to zero. And all of a sudden it says successful funding. And I get an instant email from Amazon. Hey, your account just grew by $165,000. <laughs> and again, it all this happened at one time, you know, like within three minutes, you know, I'm like, wow. Oh, wow, this is a good night, you know? Wow. So, so we got started, you know, and, uh, 
And I, I was going to say, Liza, how many of our guests on this show have funded their projects via Kickstarter? Oh, there's a bunch. Just, and there's a, a bunch that we have contributed to that yeah. as well. Yeah. I wonder if that's where I, I may have funded the one of the backers. <laughs> I don't know if I would do it again, though. <laughs> it's a yeah, lot. Yeah, that, that is hard. Right. Very stressful. So, so uh, Emma brought this up earlier. I want to bring it up again. One of the things I really enjoyed was seeing early on when John was young and he's getting into racing and doing the, um, the Jack Pine and stuff like that. On Harley's, and I believe there's a scene where there's a, it's a BMW, you know, but. Yeah, but these are, and a BMW, yeah. These are not dirt bikes. I want to be clear. These are not, these are street bikes that they modified, lifting the fender, put, changed the tires, did that stuff, right? And they're riding them in sand and mud and rivers and, and it's crazy. And then as uh, the, the Pentons became known at the, the Jack Pine race, um, then the, the British bikes, BSAs, these much lighter, nimble bikes showed up. And that kind of started changing things. But the Pentons, John Penton, he was on board quick with that. And uh, he ultimately then working with, uh, I guess he was on the Husky first and then he started bringing the, the KTM, the, the Penton bike that was correct KTM. And it, it changed the dirt biking as we know it completely. And in a pretty short amount of time, I would say, going from those big Harleys. Well, yeah. I mean, and part of the thing was John wanted, he'd, he'd got an experience when he went to Europe on the BMW. He was amazed at how nimble the tiny little displacement bikes were in the woods, you know, the 50, mm -hmm. 100 CC bikes. And he knew that that was the market. Like, Hey, if we can make a small dirt bike, specialty dirt bike. And, and he was distributing Husqvarna's at the time. And they were only interested in the big stuff, 250s, 400s, whatever, right? 500s. And they wouldn't make, and he just, he gave the idea to Husky first, that, hey, you guys need to make a little bike, a 125 or 100. And they said, no, that's not where the market is. So that's when he decided to do it himself. And he had met some engineers from KTM. And at the time, if you remember KTM in 1967, they were like known as a, they were making scooters and bicycles and mm -hmm. mopeds and they weren't in the dirt bike business, but um, they had some engineers who were dirt bike enthusiasts. So they would build their own kind of contraptions after work at KTM and go race the six days. And that's John met some of those people in Poland and they invited him to come to the, the factory in Austria in um, Modighofen. So so uh, he was a great rider, and then uh, he got uh, invited over to the Six Days event. Um, but the other thing I loved was that he had a lot of children, and he got all of them, uh, the boys and the girls, all riding. I love the story about the little Honda that they were riding on the farm. That was a sign on, on the building that they <laughs> yeah. pulled down and got it running. <laughs> yep. They would all tear around on this little Honda. But the, the, I think my favorite story was at the six days where three of his sons and John were all competing together. And the six days is one of the hardest events in the world. Yeah, that was 1970, Liza. And that and, was his last and his son's first. And I think his, was it Jeff who was only like 15, I think? Jack. Yeah, Jack, but Jack was 15. And, yeah, and yeah, that was in Spain. Yeah, El Sporeal. And I think the, the sons did, did better. I think did, uh, he didn't, John didn't finish that time, right? Uh, or he no. got, no, he got a silver. He might've got a silver. Yeah, he got a silver. He never got a gold, the whole yeah, yeah, yeah. deal, right? So um, mm -hmm. yeah, John was too busy bashing his hands and crashing and, you know, so. so you know, that's also, I mean, if, if people remember the movie on any Sunday, that was the, the six days where Malcolm was the star of for on any Sunday, so. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so he was creating uh, future AMA Hall of Famers and his sons, too, keeping that going. While building this business, he has his dealership and importing stuff and, and, and telling uh, KTM what to build for the market here. And then he started bringing over gear and started changing that. 
the high point gear, oh. the those boots yeah. with the metal on the front that are now like you see like punk rockers wear, you know? Yeah, they're classic. That was a fashion thing. But uh -huh. before that, I think people were just wearing like linesman boots or something, right? Yeah, you know, and, and um, when John, uh, you know, not he didn't discover Alpine Stars, mm -hmm. um, but they're the ones who he worked with to make those high point boots. And, you know, we all knew how, what Alpine Stars is like today, right? Yeah. You know, and, mm -hmm. um, and it was a funny story because they went over, um, John and um, his um, sidekick went over there to Italy um, to look for a boot maker and they got lost there in the Oslo area where all the boot makers are. <laughs> I like this story. And so they ended up seeing a sign that said, oh, hey, these guys make boots. Let's go ask them if they know where the other boot maker is, right? And it was Alpine Stars. And so when they went in, they met Sante Mazzarola and he's like, well, I can make those boots for you. And, you know, the rest of his history, you know, and those guys had a long, long relationship. And it's like people said, you know, in the seventies, you know, the whole gate of motocross guys would be wearing high point boots, you know, so. Oh, yeah. I had a set of those, those my first actual motorcycle boots I bought, I think. There you go. So, yeah. so, so, I mean, and, you know, it wasn't just the boots, it was the gear that it was, they, you know, they developed oils with Spectro mm -hmm. you know, to come up with a high point oil and help put Spectro on the map. Um, just all kinds of little, you know, his brother, Ted, uh, built the first forward falling starting gate in America for the motocross track. I didn't put that in the movie, but it was just another mm. one of those wow. things, you know, that the Pentons did and, cool. and uh, you know, and John imported the first couple um, pallets of Red Bull back in like the late 80s. <laughs> no way. <What? laughs> yeah. A funny, a funny story that, that, that um, uh, the guys in Austria, because that's where, you know, Salzburg's yeah. not far from Nottinghofen where Red Bulls originated. And they had said, hey, this is going to be the neat stuff. And so John had a couple. Um, pallets of the stuff thrown on it containers of ktms headed to amherst ohio where he lives and i don't know what happened with it they drank it whatever but he thought he was going to be the importer of the stuff you know so all right <laughs> wow. so so red bull alpine stars ktm we can all trace back to pentons and then not to mention like i said ama hall of famers and champion racers is there anything yeah. else we can uh, attribute to well the, the international six-day enduro right he brought that to the u.s yeah, they brought it to the U.S. in 1968, was instrumental in getting that thing, not, uh, not 68, but in 73, Dalton, Massachusetts, right. you know, and, um, right. yeah. and up until we made the movie, and it came out in 2014, and the Americans had never won the six days as of 2014, right? They came close the year before with, when Kurt Cassell, they got second, you know, so... I mean, for John's entire life, it was his goal to support, you know, it was a very patriotic thing to keep supporting those riders right. to win that international title. You know, for those that ride. don't know, the ISDT, it's almost like the Olympics of motorcycling. There yeah. is so much national pride among all countries. Because at the beginning of the ISDT, you have your country with your team and the flag, got to have a flag, and you're walking like it's the beginning of the Olympics. There's that much. It's a big deal. It's a very big deal. Yeah, and it's a it's a it's a very difficult thing to do, as Dick Burleson says. I mean, you have to have, you know, you're only as good as your slowest team member, right? Um, the six of your six man team, and you have to be perfect for six days. You know, keep the motorcycle together, finish start and finish on time. You know. Um, and it's really hard, you know, to, to do that over six days, you know. Oh, I thought of something. Then one of the, his sons, who created the hingeable shifter? Tom shifting? Penton. Tom yeah. Penton. Yeah. 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 Something we take, <laughs> take for granted today on dirt bikes, but the, the hingeable shift lever. Folding so, shift lever. Yeah. Yeah. And this is something I love about this family. And this is why I wanted to highlight this American family, I mean, they, it's never good enough. They're, they're, they're always out there to improve and to find and to make things better. 
Yeah, and the family, even to this day, you know, they're all very, very humble people, you know. Um, they were just regular people that you know, were farmers and uh, mm -hmm. the kids worked on the farm and, and worked in the motorcycle shop and, and rode and dad didn't cut him any slack. And uh, dad was a great rider too. And I like it. Jack Penton says, you know, it's like, man, if you wanted to, if you wanted to go riding with your dad, you had to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> and you learned to ride very good, very quickly. You know, you had cousins who were racing. It was a very competitive yeah. family, you know, and, and uh, no, no slackers, uh, were allowed in the Penton family, you know. So is there another generation of Pentons out there? Um, there really isn't on the racing side of it, you know. Wow. So it, it all kind of ended with Jack, John, and Tom because um, their kids. Uh, and, and Jeff. Now, and Jeff, you know, their kids are into other things. And, you know, so hmm. when you go to Pentonville and Amherst, Ohio, you know, it's all the original haunts are still there and everything, but there's, you know, no big legacy other than bumping into John at KTM if you happen to be there in the mornings, you know, so. Well, and, and just to further emphasize the, the great lineage of the Pentons, let's go back a couple generations and tell us a story about Ford and, and his first car because there was a Penton there. Yeah, so John's grandfather, um, and I don't know why his name is, uh, I think his name was Henry too, uh, lived in the same neighborhood when Henry Ford was just getting his, uh, experimenting with his first gas powered engine. Yeah. And, uh, they were just neighbors in the same neighborhood there in, in Michigan. And John's grandfather worked at a steamship company and so they were in the steam power, right? Well, Henry asked his grandfather, John Grandfather, to go. Uh, Hold on one second. Jim! Please stop that. Sorry. I have to yell at him every now and then. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought my mic was muted. I'm listening to the story. It's fascinating. I know. <laughs> sorry. My bad. So John's grandfather um, uh, was asked by Henry Ford, like, hey, can you take some of these parts to work and machine these for him? I don't know. Maybe it's a flywheel or a crankshaft or something, right? A head. I don't know. And so that's what uh, John's grandfather um, would do for Henry Ford. And at some point, you know, Henry Ford had built his kind of first contraption and kind of asked John's grandfather, hey, do you want to get involved in this thing? And <laughs> John's grandfather said, no, I don't get that internal combustion stuff. Nah, steam power is the way to go. And, and that was a <laughs> I'm not made a decision there. I'm not falling for that infernal combustion engine stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, funny story at the beginning of the film so yeah and that's exactly you were so thorough and in including from this john's grandfather down through all the pentons and everything that they've had their hands in but again as you say such humble people i just love the images of john who's like in the film i think he's about almost 90 and uh you know he's in his shorts and his galoshes and he's out there cutting down trees you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i you know when you do one of these projects you always kind of wonder you know how are you going to start it and how are you going to end it you know um and we knew john talking about his farm a lot and you know we were out there me and my camera operator it was just me and one guy you know and like well let's go out and shoot some stuff for you at the farm you know and went out there and spent a day with him driving his tractor and cutting stuff and you know we just kind of put that stuff away you know um and i don't know at some point you know with lyle's voice whatever just felt like you know like let's start with john in the woods because who's this old man by himself driving a tractor in the woods you know and uh you know amherst is a quaint little town and and we had shot some you know older retiree kind of guys in the local cafe and stuff and just felt like the kind of the right way to get into this story you know um, yeah, it was great. So I do have another question for you. So in the film, you feature some flashback scenes and yeah, people absolutely. riding old bikes, but these look like beautifully restored bikes. Are these bikes from the Penton family? Were these the original bikes that are still in the family? Yeah, so that, you know, this is kind of, you know, for me as a filmmaker, you know, I'm used to using, you know, if I can find some archival home movies or still pictures or things like that for B-roll, but 
we knew we didn't have a lot of that material to cover John's early life just because mm -hmm. this stuff didn't exist. So we're like, okay, we're going to do all these reenactments, right? Which is fun, you know, but it can be expensive and whatever, you know, but um, so we needed motorcycles to do this. Well, it turns out, you know, two of the motorcycles, the BMW mm -hmm. that was used in the movie um, and the NSU. Right. NSU. Oh, God, it. Yes. The NSU. Those are actually Jesus. John's race bikes. I was I wondering. That, cool. that NSU is absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Um, we have a local museum with a Supermax in it. And whenever I, whenever I go to Talbot's, I'll just sit and look at that Supermax because it is such a gorgeous bike. And the thought of riding it off-road, it'd be a freaking tragedy. Yeah, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> <laughs> so both of those bikes were found locally um, by um, a gentleman, Jeff Bohr, who's a member, was the member of uh, one of the members of the, was kind of around the corner from the Pentons, Jack. Um, and uh, he restored those bikes, both those bikes. And those were actual John's race bikes that other people had. Wow. I think the NSU was found in a chicken coop. <laughs> How appropriate. And so he restored them. And, you know, ha having the conversation of, hey, so you think we could ride those bikes and pretend it's John? Oh, yeah, no problem. That, you know? That's exactly, no. we were watching it in the garage. And I'm like, Emma, I want to know where he... What idiot allowed him to take their restored bikes and ride it in the woods and in the well, morning? Well, now you know. Like, now now you know. Oh, he was, <laughs> Jeff was all for it. And, and, um, yeah. and he was like our, you know, vintage bike wrangler. Um, and the Harleys that we used at the beginning of the movie were, that came from an, um, the Bale family, um, which is close by. And, and they had the right year, right model Harleys that they let us ride too, you know. So it really worked out well to have, and and the purple Honda step through, mm -hmm. yes, that you like so. Mm -hmm. The guy who built the NSU on the NSU and the BMW, he he had that an old step through Honda. Um, it wasn't a fifty; it was a ninety at the time, but it had no motor in it, right? So he made the purple bike for us for the movie, right? Oh, he nice. even got one and painted it purple and everything, but he didn't have a motor for it. All he had was a ninety cc Honda um, uh, ATV motor for a three-wheeler, mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm. uh, or a four-wheeler, right, and the, the mounts are all the same, so we put that in there, right, and it was funny because it had reverse, right, <laughs> <laughs> so we, were getting, we were getting a big kick out of having the people, the kids, right, and those are all John's, uh, Jack's uh, grandkids that are all the Penton kids in the movie, those are nice. all Pentons cool. in the movie, all the, the young Jeff and the young uh, Jack and the those are all Penton kids, grandkids in the movie, right? So we had a lot of fun. But the BMW in particular, when we first started shooting the movie, the BMW was like, it was like a shell frame, forks, wheels on it. The motor wasn't in it. Seat was on it. Mm. And Jeff was like, oh, I'll get this. When are you going to want to shoot this? And I said, ah, maybe in November, you know, um, or the springtime, I forget what it was, but he goes, I'll, I'll have it ready for that. So he actually got the bike finished and restored it um, for to get it so we could shoot that bike. Oh, right? Wow. Great. And awesome. if you remember the opening scene, you know, it starts with John riding that bike um, across the, the field, water, the woods, across the field, mm -hmm. across the field shot. Mm -hmm. um, we went to Pennsylvania, this a private farm with that bike, and he just put it together. And we got a few runs across with it, and we had a helicopter. We didn't, this is yeah. Our drone couldn't keep up, but we had a helicopter we were using for that shot. That someone let us borrow. Another Penton guy had a friend in the sheriff's department <laughs> had a helicopter that we could put our camera guy in. And so we were out there, drove you know 150, 200 miles to this farm because we could ride all over the farm for that whole opening sequence. And we got like a couple shots across the field and maybe through the woods a little bit. It's on the DVD, if you watch it, there's the story of it. And the motor completely disintegrated. Oh, oh no. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's no. odd, and it came through the case, and yeah, Yikes. we were done, right? And because the motor was an originally kind of a hot-rotted motor, you know, it had been bored out and whatever. Um, so, yeah, so poor Jeff Ward, the gentleman who owned the motorcycle, 
and it's John's, it's Jack's son is riding it. Um, Adam Penton is riding the bike when it disintegrated. And we'd only gotten a couple shots at the thing, right? So we, uh, so Jeff ended up putting the motor back together. And then we went back out there. I think this was in November because of the weather. We could see the weather's kind of shitty. And all that close up stuff, him riding through the water, slow motion and burn up. That is the second time we used the motorcycle. Wow. So it took two times to get those shots. Excuse wow. me, one second. Two Jim. Tangents. Please quit banging. That wasn't Jim. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> there you go. That wasn't hey, me. Go, was that you? No, I'm just sitting here. Todd, was that you? I don't know. I'm not banging anything. Yeah, someone was banging. Sorry, Jim. My bad. Um, <laughs> but that, uh, but I, that's I, a great story. Yeah. So and, then, I, oh, yeah. and I really love those recreated shots. They they really added a, a really just a, 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 a this this kind of a time travel feel to the movie. It, did. it was really cool. Yeah. How how long did it take you to make the uh, movie, Todd? We started uh, shooting in the spring of 2013 so about a year wow okay yeah so that's that's actually short in the world that i'm used to dealing in so um so yeah we started in the spring and then the movie we came out in june of 2014 so um so we went to europe with john and those guys in the summer of 2013 for a couple weeks and so my question to you todd in in the seven years that's gone by would you would you make the movie differently now uh, it's such a the story is so strong i th i mean i think the movie's great as is but i'm i'm also my worst critic and i look look at bikes i restored seven years ago and i think what's this piece of shit here yeah you know i don't know i don't think i would do anything different you know i think it's I've I've been told it's too long because it's two hours and fifteen minutes long, but people yeah, say yeah. But the story oh. needs to be that length to well, tell. Well, that's, that's what I say, you know. Um, and it has about three endings if you watch it. You know, it ends about three right. different times. You know, but <laughs> I just can't cut stuff. You know, that's my own problem. You well, know? well, well. Let's let's go to an easier question then. What did what did John make of it? Oh, good question. You know, all the Pentons really didn't know what to think at first, you know, and, and they're very, the Penton Owners Group, because they contributed to our Kickstarter funding, they didn't know who I was. And so they were very protective of the story, right? Yeah, and oh yeah, of course. The Penton Owners Group had funded Ed Youngblood's book. And uh, so I had to send them, I sent them all a bunch of DVDs of our other movie we had done on the Carlsbad U.S. Grand Prix in 1980 when the first American won it, Marty Motes. Um, so I said, Hey, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Here's the movie, you know, <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, at the end, they're all super, super appreciative. And, and I'm, you know, the best part about it is I'm considered the, the son of a different mother now with, the, uh, -huh. the oh, that's, that's great because you, you approach it in, in such a respectful way. Um, it, it's obvious these are very, very motivated men. And they're very driven men. And when somebody is that driven and motivated, they can be, I'm not going to say difficult, but they can be, as you say, a little protective of their story. Strong will. But I think, I think you showed that, that drive in a very respectful way. Well, and... You know, one of the things that attracted me, and it's in the book, but as much as the motorcycle stories and the racing and John's a tough guy and kept crashing, get hurt, keep riding, whatever, is the family aspect of the right. story. And the I mean, tragedies. tragedies. I mean, the tragedies. Oh, but, and I just knew that, you know, we <laughs> we had a winner on our hands when we if we could capture those moments in the right way, right? Because that's, right. that's the stuff that would attract people who don't give a shit about motorcycles. Right, exactly, because that's the story. And this is an own thing. If you go back to those hokey shows from 10, 15 years ago, like American Chopper, or even the Jesse Jones. Watch Jesse it, James Emma, shows. watch it. <laughs> well, yeah, but hang on. They were strong shows because they were about bikes. And if you like bikes, 
there was plenty in it for you. But there were great family stories as well. And American Chopper was not just about bikes. It was right. about the Tuttles. And that's what drew in, as you say, the non-motorcycling people. And I think we're finding that with our YouTube channel, Liza, yeah. is that the non, you know, people watch us and think we're entertaining as heck. But if we just talk about motorbike parts, we're going to lose half our audience very quickly because there's nothing for people who don't like bikes. So I, I found it interesting you said that uh, you needed to, like, convince them that you're, you're qualified to do this movie. You're legit. But I'm, but I'm going to be honest. I have a different way of qualifying people, Todd. So I have to ask you, what bike do you ride? <laughs> Well, actually, I don't ride anything currently because I what? had a, well, I had a uh, Yamaha Super Tenere. Oh, okay. Oh, that's okay. a good bike. Yeah. That's my that's, favorite, Todd. Well, I've had it for years and ended up um, uh, selling it because I was going to buy, and still I'm going to buy, a Honda Africa Twin. <gasps> oh, <laughs> guess, guess what, Todd? You're in the right club now, Todd. Guess <laughs> what? Jim, <laughs> ha Jim has an Africa Twin. Well, and I, I have an Africa twin. Oh, now we got to find out which one are you looking at? Because oh, I, I, it's going to be a DCT. Oh, I win! I win! <laughs> Venture Sports model. That's what I got. So All I know I, I, is, last is... summer, I'll tell you the story. I have I've had this Tenere since 2011, and I love it. It's been to Mexico a bunch of times with us and all my friends who have KTM 990s and 1090s, whatever. They're always amazed at how. I ride that thing where they go on theirs, right? And not that, you know, but whatever, I'm just trying to keep up, right? Well, I had the opportunity to take, um, Simon Cudby is a friend of mine from um, Upshift Magazine. Mm -hmm. um, and he had a press bike from Honda, uh, Adventure Sports Africa Twin. He says, hey, you wanna ride this in Idaho, Montana? And Wait like, a minute, yes. how long ago was this? Two years ago. Guess what? <laughs> <laughs> is that the bike you own now, Liza? That is my bike. <laughs> awesome. I, I got it from Honda. It was their test yeah, bike. Probably the same bike. This, nope. Yeah, this, that's what it was. They had a bunch of them. They had a few of them out there floating around, but that bike ruined me for the Super Tenere. So <laughs> the Tenere. I got back on the Tenere when I got home. I'm like, man, this thing's a pig. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so Jim yeah. has the, the standard manual, and it is nice that we have both and then can do a lot of comparisons. Oh, I would agree. Although you, I think you did just crush Emma because she loves that Super Tenere so dearly. She wants one of us to own one, but we refuse to. Well, no, but Charlie's she, got... You love that bike. Charlie got it. I oh, drove right. Charlie's Super Ten today. He let me take it out for a spin. And having been on the AT DCT model in Tennessee ah, a few years ago, see? you know, I, I got to side with you. It so, I mean, if I could have owned both, I would have kept the Super Tenere because I like it on the street and I like cruising more kind of just touring rides with it, you know, but when it comes to the dirt and we were up there on the low, you know, oh. low, low motorway in the, you know, where Lewis and Clark, you know, the same trail that Lewis and Clark were on in Idaho and, you know, what's his name? Chase the Nez Pierce Indians back to, you know, whatever, same road, you know, we're on this awesome dirt bike adventure. I'm, I just had to pinch myself because I'm like, man, we're on our own adventure, like Lewis and Clark, and you know, it was just no, I both. think you do. I think you're doing the right thing, Todd, because if you bought a manual transmission Africa Twin, I think you'd miss the power of the Super Ten. Whereas you're buying a DCT, so it's such a completely different bike. You're not comparing the two. Yeah, well, and. And, you know, I was kind of, had, you know, like, okay, the DCT was available. I wouldn't have bought one had I not ridden it, spent four days with it, right? Because mm -hmm. I got intimately used to how that thing performed in manual mode and on the auto mode. And it has some issues, you know? <clears throat> I think mm -hmm. the, the gravel mode built into it is like gravel mode for pussies. You so mean the, wheel, the wheelie <laughs> mode? What's that? You mean the wheelie mode? <laughs> well, it just... And you know what? I told the guys at Honda this. It needs it needs the reverse from the the gold wing on it. I'm guessing I'm that you are under six feet tall then. Well, no, but even when no, once, 
I found out in four days that you put, yeah. you know, a hundred pounds of gear on it or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And it's tall, especially adventure. It's sport a tall bike. Long. Yeah, it's a tall bike. Just if you go down to like a dirt road and you're like, oh, we got the wrong way, turn around. Yeah. Right. And you're digging your feet in to try to back it up just to turn it around to go the other way. It's tall. It's a big bike, isn't it? I, yeah. I, I, well, I agree with you. I, I am a, a large person, and this is the first bike I've ever had where I felt intimidated when I was trying to move it around when I was off the bike. Yeah. Um, so that makes it's, sense quite, to... it's, it's actually quite funny because when Liza is pushing that Africa twin around, she goes very red and she makes noises like a steam engine. <laughs> it's Honda red. It's Honda red. It's, yeah, it's Honda red. red. And she's... Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Yes, just, it's, it's so, really quite funny. Just so you know, in, in case it matters to you at all, Todd, because of that answer, I now qualify you to make the John Penton story. Okay, great. I, I don't know if it matters this late, but just so you know, here's what a badass I am. Look at this. That's me writing down a you, telephone pole. On oh, yeah. Phone. Hey, Liza, show him the picture of you riding over the cars. <laughs> oh, that's right. There's not one of you riding over the cars. Me. That's me riding over hey, the cars. Well, and if it, if it helps a little bit, I also have a, a 69... Oh. Penton six days coming together in my garage. Ooh. Oh, oh nice. cool. So, that was cool. And then I have a 79 Honda Elsinore Marty Smith replica and a JT1 Mini Enduro Yamaha. So all oh. dirty stuff. You like you, you like are a dirt bike bikes. guy. I am a dirt bike guy. So there these are all like the bikes I wish I had when I was a kid or Heroes bikes or whatever, you know, so. Cool. You know. Can I, I interest you in a CRF 250L? <laughs> no. no thank you but you know just to go back because you um on on the film with talking about how you know we wanted to make it appeal to people who are non-motorcycle mm -hmm. riders you know um john jack told us a story that him and his and when the movie came out his him and his dad along with myself but you know we got invited to go to you know because the way we screened the movie through gather films you know, we had these, we had over a hundred screenings, public screenings of it, you know, um, actually made money on it, you know, um, and they would get invited to come to these screenings in Baltimore and Florida and whatever, and the dealers would pay for them plane tickets and whatever, just to come to their screening of the movie. And, and Jack had told us the story of his dad was sitting there next to this young gal. She was in her thirties, maybe, and she had no idea who he was. And he's sitting next to her in the movie theater. And, uh, John's talking to her like, oh, hey, so do you like motorcycles? And she's like, no, I'm not really into motorcycles. My boyfriend brought me to this thing. So I'm just here to hang out with him, right? He's like, oh, okay. And John doesn't, you know. And so John remembers looking over it halfway through, maybe one of the family scenes, emotion when someone dies, you know, whatever. He looks over and she's got tears streaming Aww. down her face, Aww. you know, and just riveted <laughs> to the, the movie. So... I'm like, okay, you know, we, we know we did our job then, right? So, you know, those, those so moments, you know. It's a great story. And yeah. it's so appropriate for this weekend because it's, it's such an American story. And I think, I think that's, that's what really drew me in. Now, I should also remind you that you're all celebrating independence from us a lot. Yeah, However, that's why we invited you to dinner. You were grateful <laughs> colonials, <laughs> really. Um, but it's, it's, it's a wonderful, at its heart, it's a wonderful family story. And it is, it is such an American story. But it, there are international players. That's what makes it so good. It's this driven American traveling all over the world to get what he wants. It's the yeah, we could have made the ever. movie. We could have made the movie without going to Europe. You know, I mean, we probably could have just yeah, but it wouldn't have been the same, people. would it? It wouldn't have. You know, it was just you know, let's go there, spend the money, go to Austria, go to Italy, because this is where it all happened. You know, and and to have those international people, you know, speak in German or Italian or whatever, <laughs> uh, and it was important to have those people. So. <laughs> I never, the thing never is, speaking. They they talk about John and the family with with such respect and with such reverence you know there's real there's real feeling for john in that movie and it's 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 not contrived at all it's quite genuine 
Yeah, if you go to any of these, um, you know, six days reunions they have in Europe and things like that, I mean, the Pentons really are treated like they're motorcycle royalty, you know. Um, KTM last year opened up their new museum and, you know, they could have put the KTM version of the Penton in their new museum, right? Showing the eras of all the KTMs, but that motorcycle that's in there says Penton on it, you know? Right. And the people from KTM, Mr. Uh, um, Stephen Pierre, you know, he made sure that John was equal to anybody himself <laughs> in that room for that ceremony, you know? And, nice. and uh, it's a big deal, you know? I mean, literally, I mean, when you compare those kinds of families, you know, it's, you know, John and I think we were at the AMA Hall of Fame ceremony a few years ago in Florida and, mm -hmm. and uh, Willie Davidson had been inducted in something. So he someone right. gave, gave a big shout out to, you know, hey, there's only one other family in the room that had their name on a motorcycle, you know? Yeah, <laughs> right. Jean ben, you know? So, nice. and you know, if you, if you think about it, Todd, I mean, the repercussions of this whole KTM and Penton collaboration. Last week, we devoted a large portion of the show to the Paris Dakar rally. Oh. And I mean, KTM had a huge impact in that rally. For a, for a long time in the 80s and 90s, it was really the KTM rally. All the major players mm -hmm. were there. And without Penton's insistence yeah. on the direction for his bike and the development KTM were able to put into the dirt bike, that may never have happened. And I suspect that the people at KTM know that. I mean, KTM really had an illustrious dirt biking reputation. Yeah. And I think you can trace it back to the Penton years. Yeah, it's hard not to, right? Like, who knows? I mean, what, that's Genesis. Who yeah. knows what it would have become of KTM had John Pent not walked in their door, right, in the fall of 1967, you know? Um, I mean, they had, they had engineers who were tinkering with their own bikes and things like that. So it's probable that KTM would have got in the dirt bike business somewhere sometime yeah. you know whether it's a year from but, now, years from now yeah, it, it, we get into this whole who what when oh, where yeah. um and uh, i've but, actually restored a penton for a museum yeah. uh for a local museum however it was an interesting it was an interesting bike and i'll have to go back and research my notes um but it was the sax engine yeah but it was a british frame i think it was a wassel frame oh it was a trials bike the wassel yeah, the Wastel. Yeah. yeah. Mm. You know, and that was a very odd duck. So you it, know the bike. Yeah, it's a, um, it's the uh, Mudlark, they called it. Yeah, not the best looking thing. No. Wait a minute. Mudlark, it, we need to add that to our list of bikes with animal names. Oh, yes, we yeah. do. The Mudlark. Yeah. Mm. It's so, a, it was um, a Mudlark. It was a Wastel frame with a sax yes. engine. And yeah. I don't think it was one of their finest moments building that bike, but... But you know what? Like, I mean, it makes for a great display in the museum because course, everything yeah. else is quite colorful and people are like, what the hell is that? <laughs> 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 but yeah, it's, it's, it hasn't got quite the grace of the um, enduro bikes, I think yeah. is the best way to describe it. It's a bit, it's a bit humpty back. <laughs> it looks like... Um, it's almost got like a praying mantis kind of feel about it, but maybe an arthritic praying mantis. Well, the, the Penton story was a story that needed to be told, and I'm so glad that you did. I'm so glad I became aware of it. And I just wanted to remind everyone that it will be in our film festival, August 14th through 16th. Go to RevSisters.com. But I also want to give people an opportunity, if there are people out there like me, who wants to own a DVD to go on the shelf next to on any Sunday and all the other great movies, where's the best place for people to get their own copy? Oh, they can just go to Amazon. It's on That's Amazon. Right. It does a lot of them for us. It is on Amazon. There you go. $17.99. $17.99. That is a bargain. And it's on you Vimeo On Demand me. too. So Yeah. You tell me where you're going to get over two hours of entertainment a very high class entertainment for less than 18 bucks. There yeah. You know. And there's lots of uh, bonus features on there and some um, extras and 
behind the scenes stuff and where where can we see that intro with the uh, uh that you were telling us about in the dark forest with the uh, lyle lovett interview and the bike is, is that on, on the cutting room floor somewhere it, it's not right, there is a something on youtube i don't know if it's a trailer or if it's yeah, the, um, there is a short it film on youtube teaser, and i have to find it um i should um you should post it onto youtube yeah it's um I know there were some issues maybe with the music on it. You know, Lyle said, go ahead and use it. It's, he had, he, it was music that he had lifted from somebody else and he had permission to use it. But mm, I see. Um, there may be, but we'll find it. Cause it, it was a clever idea. Cause it was only one shot, you know, like a camera from action to one shot, you know, and, uh, right. and it worked out pretty well, you know, so. Well, since you had such the vision of, of finding this story, I'm now curious to know if there are any other stories that you <laughs> may be telling or that you want to tell. You know, we're working on a movie. Uh, it's kind of hit and miss on shooting it just because my crew, everybody's working for free on it because we just want to get it done on the history of the Catalina Grand Prix. Oh, that's a good one. Ooh. Which it's a really good story. Um, we were over there in 2010 when they did the race, the one year. And uh, we were going to, we were shooting to actually go in the new on any Sunday. And uh, so we were over there. We spent a bunch of money, $75,000 on a huge crew, 20 people and to shoot the race. And then a year and a half later, Red Bull kind of took over the movie. And so in the new on any Sunday, uh, you barely, they used a couple clips, right? Because they took the thing, the project in a different direction. So uh, we had this stuff sitting on a shelf. And no one had ever seen it before. And I'm like, well, let's do something. So we started shooting interviews, um, you know, with Dave Eakins and Preston Petty and all the old guys too. So half the movie will be on the, <laughs> the up until 1958 Catalina Grand Prix. And the other half will be on what happened in 2010. You know, so. I would like to share a, bit, a brief Catalina story. You know, as a child, I grew up in Birmingham and we have, we had, because I think it's closed now. We had the most wonderful museum of science and industry. And as a tiny child, I thought it was the best place ever. And it was full of motorbikes because of course that's where most English motorbikes were made. Yep. And they were very austere colors. They were gray and maroon and black. And right in the middle was this gorgeous baby blue scrambler covered in chrome and looked quite unlike anything else in that museum and of course it was the bsa catalina named after the catalina grand prix and it, it was like nothing else in there because it was so far removed from these quite dowdy austere offerings <laughs> for the home market and it's the if you've never seen a catalina eliza it is the brightest shade of sky blue you have ever seen and there's a picture of catalina the island on the top of the gas tank it's oh. a wonderful thing. A big wow. chrome gas tank and blue. It's, it's a fabulous looking thing, but it was named after the Grand Prix. Can I paint my KZ like that? Yeah, you can. You can paint your KZ. Ooh. So, um, Todd, you're a movie guy. I've got a question for you. What, what's your favorite movie scene? What is your favorite scene? It can be from any movie. It doesn't have to be a motorbike movie. And why what, is it Bullet? And what... <laughs> scene and you either think yeah. how the hell did they do that or it just takes your breath away because the cinematography is so good are we talking about a motorcycle scene no any scene uh, okay any scene in any movie because todd's a movie guy so he can include porn porns in this yes oh okay. my yes. <laughs> it is this. especially if steve mcqueen is involved <laughs> Steve McQueen porn. Because there are a lot of times you go, host, how are they a, doing that? Can, <laughs> I, I mean. can, I, can I just give you a teaser and tell you mine, Todd? It's yeah. the very, very closing scene of In the Heat of the Night, where Sidney Poitier gets on the train, and you see him in the train window, and it's moving quite quickly, and the camera just keeps panning back. And I still don't know how they do that shot, because it was like 1965. It had to be a helicopter shot. But it starts as a head and shoulders of him in the, in the window. 
Yeah, right. And it just keeps panning back. It's an absolutely fantastic shot. I still don't know how they did it back then. You know, I, technically, I don't know if I look at, you know, of course, recently, you know, I was amazed at 1911 just because, you know. Yeah, I've heard yes. that's amazing. The you opening know, scene was that. mind-blowing. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, they have one, right. one right. take in it that is, one scene is over seven and a half minutes and it's one shot, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, it was, that was, that was awesome. And how they did it. So technically, I mean, I, I like that kind of stuff, but, you know, kind of, I don't know when people, if I've been asked this before, kind of like, what are your kind of favorite movies? Not necessarily the scenes, but, you know, I go back to the first Dirty Harry movie and at the end, yes. on the pier, on that little wharf and the, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, did he but find you know, the only you, six? You know, you, you kind of strike me as a kind of, you're, you're an old school guy, you're an analog kind of guy. So I think you probably, you, you're not that appreciative of CGI. I mean, you know, in, the, in that, in your movie, it's the authenticity of the scenes. And you've got an actor playing John Penton, but it's very authentic. They're on restored bikes and they're in the proper locations. And, you know, there's no CGI to be found, which is great. I love oh, it. Yeah, we, you know, that the scene uh, where John went to Mexico after his wife dies. Yeah. You know, we shot that two weeks before the movie opened in out in Barstow, out by Slash X. Um, on the highway that goes past Slash X from Lucerne to Barstow. And um, and the good folks at uh, Irv Seavers had the BMW motorcycles for us to use to do the Earl Flanders scene. And that's um, that was, to me, you know, to have this guy, you know, doing this and recreating that because it was just as I knew what the guy said in our, the, what we call the radio cut, you know, the offline at it, you know, so I knew kind of what I wanted and to kind of see it happen out of the back of the truck, our pickup truck was really just come awesome. to life in front of you. Yeah, and I just um, knew it was gonna be good. And then oh, when we get to use Lyle Lovett's Road to Ensenada music to go with it, oh this will make people, you know, makes me well, that's so funny. You don't you don't hear people men mention the slash the slash X very often on that like, I know the exact spot you're talking about. I go right down in Lucerne Valley every now and then. <laughs> it is beautiful down there. But yeah, what a funky little spot. Yeah, well, we had to kind of find a place to be, you know, the California desert, obviously, and 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 some part, you know, be in Mexico and everything, you know. So, well, and when I actually it was when we went to Mexico and the transcontinental record run, which in itself is an amazing part of John's history, as he set that record, you know, way back in 1958, you know. So I, I was going to say, we didn't even talk about the, his <laughs> Cannonball record. But yeah. you know what, I want to save some stuff for the film because again, it is so well done. It's such a good story. There's so many interesting little storylines within it. And yeah, he set a cannonball record that lasted, I think like 10 years. Yeah. yeah. So such a good movie. I wanted to thank you for coming on and, and talking about this amazing family, but also for for finding that story and sharing it because it is a story that needs to be told because I'm somebody who's fascinated with bikes and has been my whole life, but I didn't know about the Pentons. And it's a story that had to be told like now, because I was going to ask, you know, it's, it's full of these colorful old characters like Earl Flanders. And did you, did you have problems getting these old boys to talk to you? Not or, at all. Well, I mean, everybody, <laughs> and, and you know, the kind of the melancholy part of the story, you know, we made that, seven years ago is when we started shooting. And it. a lot of them are gone now. And a bunch of guys in that movie are gone. Yeah. So, and that's why you had the wonderful, to make it then. Well, and including the wonderful Jeff Bohr, who let us use those wonderful motorcycles. Yeah, right. You know, he, um, shortly after the movie came out, he killed over to the heart attack in the parking lot. You know, and wow. he Too bad. was only but in the, the, mid the, the, you know, so. Yeah. yeah, but then the movie becomes not just a legacy for John, but for all of those guys. Yeah. And that kind of lifestyle they were leading back then. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the all whole of the sort of post war, are... rough and tumble, scrambles, you know? The greatest generation. You know, <laughs> one of my favorite parts in the John story is, you know, you know, when the World War II broke out, you know, he thought he was doing, you know, hey, I'm going to try to avoid getting killed. I'll do my part, but I'll join the Merchant Marine, you know, and he about gets killed 
yeah. doing that, you know, then comes back and is like, oh, guess what? You're going back again, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. So thank you again for, um, no for participating in the film festival too. Um, I can't wait to share it. And this is why I wanted to talk it up. Um, yeah. And I can't wait to see what you come up with next. Well, I hope it does well. I always, you know, we, we won the motorcycle film festival in New York and yeah. we nice. on any Sunday. Uh -huh. you know, we were like proud of that. So, you know. yeah, well, it's interesting. I, why is this what, I, I've judged uh, one of the previous film festivals. And one of the things you wait, at least for me, kind of on the side is inspiration. Like after I watch a film, does that make me want to go ride motorcycles? Mm -hmm. And the Penton story, after you watch it, you want to go ride motorcycles in the woods. So I think from an inspirational standpoint, it's, it's great. I mean, you get fired up. It's a really fun movie. It awesome. makes me want to build bikes. <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean, there's a couple, you know, I, I would love to build an NSU myself and a BMW R27 and, you know. Well, it's, it sounds like, uh, so you're down in Southern California, yeah? I am in Orange County. So Jim, let's put, put him on the list. Next time we do a trip down there, I'll bring down my DCT. I'll let you ride it. And maybe I can ride something that's in your garage. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> uh, fall is coming. So desert, desert riding will be happening uh, come October-ish. All right. There we Liza, go. Liza, have you ever rid, ridden a Penton before? No, I haven't. I got to get it. it. It needs just a little more work. So there's just a little more bits for it. But, it, you know. Cool. Yeah. We, hey, did have a, I've, we did have I've an Elsinore the mud lock. the garage. <laughs> I just read the mud lock. Okay. Nice. Well, thank you very much for joining right, guys. us. Thank you. So, All right, thanks, and just, just remember, it's Penton, the John Penton story. Look it up. Get it on Amazon. Uh, come to the film festival. Watch it. Enjoy this story and learn about these rock stars of the motorcycle <laughs> world. Awesome. Take thank care. Thank you very much, Todd. Right. Thanks, Ciao, Todd. Bye, bye. Ciao, Todd. Ciao. Thanks, Todd. So um, I wanted to get to some emails and uh, Ooh, uh, by any chance, did you get that one that I sent you that's all in German? I did, as a matter of fact. <laughs> the, the email's not in German, but the article is. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, I'm going to read one first, but I just wanted to see if you can kind of like paraphrase that. Sure. Um, I wanted to share some emails. This one is from Dan and he says... Hello, Dan. Hey all, love the podcast. It normally gets me through my daily commute on the A406. Oh yes, okay. Which he says is one of the worst roads in London. It's Ooh. not fun even on a bike. It could be um, worse. It could be on the M25, darling. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember I used to listen to um, satellite radio and I'd listen to like BBC Channel 4 or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. And it was always like, all right, we've got a latter down on the M10, latter down. It's like they're, they're <laughs> dropping ladders on the freeway all the time there. It's crazy. Well, it's the brickies. They don't, they don't put them in the back of the truck properly. <laughs> they fall out. <clears throat> so he says, I love what you guys do. I was wondering if you know of any misfits or kindred spirits in London, as I haven't been able to find any sort of cooperative garage near oh, me boo. at all. Start your own, mm. darling. Exactly the answer I was going to give. You know, um, I've been saying this for years that everyone comes to us and says, do you know of anyone near me? Or, you know, how do you start one? Or how can I find one? And I tell everyone the same thing. You should start it. I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a good mechanic at all. But just because I opened up my doors and shared it, <clears throat> we all kind of learned from each other. We all became better. And then we attracted better people like Emma to come and help us. Oh, better people, is it now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not what you said earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but it's about building a community. And anyone yes. can do it with whatever small space. Even if you don't have a garage to share, um, you might be able to find. I know of people who had a... Um, there was like a coffee shop that they would meet at and work outside you know like you can do it anywhere really um build whatever small community you can or, or even if you just meet up and share ideas mm -hmm. before you start swinging wrenches because yeah. a, a cooperative <laughs> as much about talking about problems as actually fixing them so, you know, if, 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 you, if there's a coffee shop close by to you and you 
get the word out and a few like-minded oh my chain's a bit slack well yeah that does look a bit slack or no you've got plenty of life left in it you know and you just kind of exchange ideas and then somebody might come up with oh you know my sister my cousin my uncle they've got a garage maybe we could meet there and it starts very very small and gets bigger i thought they're called garages over there it is called a garage you Americans call them garages. <laughs> yeah, we're going to the garage. You put our yeah, aluminum put in the, the garage. Cadillac in so the garage. yeah, so I, I hope that answers your question. I don't know of any, but I, every you know anyone who asks me, I say you should start it. It doesn't take much. Just buy yeah. extra number ten sockets. You're good. <laughs> and chairs. <laughs> and you gotta chairs. have the chairs. <laughs> and, and chairs. And chairs. And no riding gear sits on the chair. The chair is <laughs> exactly. Yes. All right. And so, yeah. as they say in London, "Call blimey, Gov, you're a caution, <laughs> incha." Good show, eh? <laughs> I don't know anybody who actually says "good show." I think Second World War <laughs> pilots had these giant mustaches yes. and they jump out of their Spitfires. Oh, good, good show! Good show. Well, I don't think anybody said it since then. It actually, it might be a crime saying "good show." <laughs> Did they still sure. say Jolly Good, or is Jolly Good also passe? Well, Jolly Good show. The two, oh, yeah. you know, it, 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 it's, there it is. But yeah, no, I think I think it's actually illegal in Blackburn <laughs> to say Jolly Good show. <laughs> it might be. I'm so, not sure. Bagel. I'm sort of out yes. of touch myself. Do you have an email to read to us now? I do. All right. And this email is from John C. Smith from Maryland. Hey, John. Uh, John. So, well, that's where uh, Baltimore is. <clears throat> It is where Palmer is. Uh, and John says, hi, Misfits. Hello, Here, John. Here's a new job for Bagel to translate. There it is. From, from what I can it. tell, thousands of motorcyclists in Munich blocked traffic for several hours to protest a ban on motorcycles on Sundays and holidays. Not going to happen. Wow. And John closes with Gute Besserung Nach, which means Something good recovery Nach. Oh, go. Oh, that was yes. nice. Yep. Actually, so, I, I heard that Nock rode his bike this week. Oh, did he? Yeah. Ooh. Oh, that's a good So good wait, so wait, why are they trying to ban motorcycles? Okay. So apparently, uh, and this is something I, I this week in the German news, um, there are certain politicians who are trying to implement a ban on motorcycle riding on public public roads on sundays and holidays because of the noise um and yeah there were over ten thousand motorcyclists who showed up in munich alone um that was not the only city pretty much every major city had some sort of demonstration of motorcyclists out there um and they basically uh this just uh, completely halted traffic around the, the freeways and major arteries around the city and made a very, very visible demonstration of uh, motorcyclists and that they're not to be messed with. Um, and some politicians are, are jumping on their bandwagon now saying, yeah, we're not going to have any sort of uh, riding, uh, riding ban. Uh, that's completely ridiculous. So it looks like this thing is getting ready to just completely tank this whole idea, um, thanks to the engagement of motorcyclists in Germany who came out in massive numbers to demonstrate against well that. Well done. Good job. Yes. Just well don't done. drive your motorcycle in the, the cobblestone cafes where you're not supposed to. Yeah, it's not a good once. idea. You get the diners <laughs> getting up to spit on you as you go by. The, my suggestion is never to do a naked ride on a cobblestone street. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably not a good idea, and it's probably very illegal in Germany. Yes, it's, there's a lot of jingling and jangling and dingling and dangling. Yes, the riding naked is thing. not proper. You do not have the correct protective equipment on the bike. Alles correct. Yeah. Right. Herr Thank Bagler. You. Thank you, Bagel. So, um, Jim, this next one, I think you're going to have to help me. Oh, you wanted to jump in on that German thing? Oh, no, no. I just have a different one before you wrap up, but go ahead. Okay. Um, and this one comes from Jeff. He has a good question. And I think Jim and I hey, have different opinions. So we'll just see. Uh, so he says, I've heard you talking about uh, trail riding and how it's fairly common to ride through private property. Is that really common in your area? Around here, it could easily get you arrested. Do you feel it's appropriate to ride onto people's property without their permission? Why or why not? 
Okay, who so, gets to start? Mm. Um, <laughs> I, I, I will say I have my policy. <laughs> which yes, is, you do, and your, your policy is very clear. Which is ignore any signs but obey any chains or gates. Like, so you do write on the private property. If there's just a sign, but they can't even just put a chain across, I, I get up it. See, I love how this I always gets you because you never answer the question. So to answer the question, Liza, you think it's okay to write on private property? I go explore. Oh, she's the road. being evasive now. <laughs> she always does this. I know. So yeah. yeah. Know. That's okay. my policy. If it's a road and it says like uh, private road, I'll still go up it. On the oh road. God, no, that's going to get you shot, Liza. I've been with Liza down this, this, remember, where were we? We were out on those trails behind that I know, hotel. and there's been times where he was spoke. He's like, you go ahead and get yourself killed. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I always end up following you because what is a wingman supposed to do? But Yeah, right. well, you can't abandon hey, Jim, you have, you have the story about being at gunpoint at one place, right? Exactly. Well, I guess I had an evolution on my thought on this. So I was I used to <laughs> reason, like, woohoo, let's go find this, that, and the other thing. Yeah, and then you have a you know something happen like a gun pointed at you, which isn't uncommon. You talk to people that ride in certain areas up in the mountains, or, or, or you'll ride by someone holding a gun, right? Um, but I tell you, it definitely changes your your thought process. So now my answer would be no. It's not okay to ride on private roads without people's permission. Now here, here's here's one of the caveats. There's a lot of roads that are marked private that are actually open to the public, but there's private residences off these roads. And it's just very remote. And I know they're trying to deter traffic, but legally, it's a public road. So those roads I have no problem with. But as soon right. as it says private road chain or not, I, I pass um, for, for a number of reasons. Well, the, re the major reason for me would be the more remote the area is, the more there are going to be people there that value living in a remote area, which means... If you've chosen to live in a remote area, you've got a reason for that. And it could be just the most antisocial bastard imaginable, but you might have a massive weed grow going on. Either way, they're going to put a bullet in you. Well, I, and I want to say too, I, when I do so, I do it respectfully. So you're not making a lot of noise. You're not going off of the road, you know. And the thing I think is funny is Jim has been with me on every single one of these. Because well, I got no choice. <laughs> I'm, I'm your wingman. I'm drawn into it. Not to mention is... Highland Road, which is one of our favorite roads to do. Yeah. That has signs that say private road. Right. But that's one of the roads that's actually, it's a public road. Those signs so how are put do you up to find that out? traffic. Let, let um, me, you, the, I... the, a ranger told us, actually. Well, let me clarify also is that there are roads that are on private property mm -hmm. property that people actually own especially like up in the mountains but because these are actual roads they may be maybe dirt roads but they are they're you know roads that are on a map what often the case happens is that those are considered easements which is a, mm -hmm. a basically a cut <clears throat> into somebody's property which is used for public access and, and most often it's, you know, in, you know, remote communities where somebody needs to cut through your property to get to theirs. And that's what the road is for. And, but technically that, that easement is set aside on your property that, so it, it's, it's considered a right of way so that people are allowed to pass. So you can put up signs mm -hmm. that say it is private property and this is right. a private road, which technically it is because it's not maintained by any city or county and the people who live there maintain it. But that is still an easement that has public yeah. right of way. And I public think that's a major difference between Britain, say, and uh, in America, is in Britain, you will have, and I'm not sure if there's roads you can drive on, but there's, notoriously, there's these things called public footpaths. Yes. And it can go <laughs> right across a farmer's field. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, I used to walk on a, on a public yeah. footpath with my mum, and then be the farmer, exchanging yeah. low rustic wheezes with us. But, um, you know, he's working his fields and we're walking right yeah. through the middle of it because we're on the public footpath. So and it that, was deeply unpopular with the farming community, but there was bugger all they could do about it. So the answer is don't do as I do. Do as Jim says. Just know that Jim does what I do. I know. But here's what I'll say. Is, as soon as you say I do it respectfully, 
<laughs> you're not. <laughs> and, and if you really want to make sure, look up the parcel properties on the county public maps and see where the easements yeah. are to see if you have legal right away. <laughs> and here's one more thing that, because Liza and I are heading out to South Dakota, this comes into play. We are fortunate in California, or Liza is fortunate, because if you do write onto private property, California has what's called, it's a, either a castle law or not a castle law. But whichever one in California, the property owner cannot prohibit you from leaving the property, AKA shoot you. In a lot of other more conservative states, Nevada, for example, probably Utah, when you go into private property, they can shoot you and pretty much get away with it. Right, you're so, talking about the Castle Doctrine. Which, yes, Castle Doctrine. Which means your house is, you know, you have the right to defend it, basically your property is yours to defend. Yeah, so there's Castle Law, so they can, they will be much more emboldened to shoot you once you get out of California. So I'm not saying that we're going to be doing this soon, but we may. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> be careful out there, people. Where you're so that, that's the answer. Um, and, and again, I just want to um, say, be respectful. A lot of times these are private roads because yes. um, they don't want people tearing up and down. So I'm riding yeah. slow. I'm not being loud. And when I do come up to, if, it, if there's somebody's house, turn around and, and, and leave. Um, and we've been out like riding in the fields when we got chased by people, but we're being mindful. We're not leaving the road. We're not damaging any of the road. We're not being hooligans. We're just kind of exploring dirt paths. All right. So okay. and if, and if that it's, a gray, it's a gray area, I'm gonna yeah. say. Yeah, and if that dirt path turns into somebody's driveway, then yeah, that's when you know you, you need to turn around. Don't do it on the two-stroke. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? So there you go. So I think that wraps it up. Um, for Ooh, I, I had one comment yes. before we run. So yes. if you remember, we had Evil Knievel toys uh, on the oh, podcast. Oh, right. Ongo, the best toy ever made ever, right? Yeah. And we've had podcast listeners chime in and talk and everything. So there's a podcast listener, uh, Vulcan Scooter Dan is his handle. And he dropped me a nice. note and they have at the uh, website on Instagram, at least for evil can evil toys clips of everybody's movies they sent in. And it's like a little high right reel, you know, marketing the toy. And I think the, one of the first clips is me and Liza's video. Yay. And it's ah. awesome. Yay. So thanks. Shout yes. out to Dan for telling me about it. Here's where it, get, it gets better. So one of the comments underneath it is hilarious. It says, quote, Love the one in the trailer park at the beginning. Patio on fire, gas can real close. Holy hillbillies. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think we just hit it. That's right, my 15, my, my four and a half seconds of fame right there. So, um, if I can close with a gift from a very, very dear friend. Okay. Um, evil can evil toys. We have something far cooler in Britain. And oh. it's from a long time ago, and I'd forgotten. We have a Barry <gasps> Sheen toy. Oh wow! And that was a gift. From I a want one. Very, Damn it! Can't have one. It's I must from have. 1979. It's it was the last cool. one. Wow, that's cool. And I it's, must it's, have. It's Barry Sheen. Look right, at his hair. Baza. Right, eh? Baza. <laughs> <laughs> oh, does he have saying, the looms on? With 1979 hair. Call blimey gov your recognition. <laughs> Incha! <laughs> we love Barry. <gasps> nice. So there you go. Cool Tra -la -la. <clears throat> a gift from a very dear friend. Thank you, Jim. You're very welcome. So there you go. Um, hopefully next week we can hear from Knock and he can tell us his update. I know that he's, like I said, he's he, he went for a ride and he's been back to work. So we're good and solid in the go back to the fuck knock uh, sign off. We're good with that. He's not okay, doing any wheelies yet, I hope. <laughs> no. That's good. Yeah, I think I, I'm hoping he's growing up a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and hey, if you're in the market for a new motorcycle, I know of the CRF 250L, the KTM 990 SMT, and the Versus 650 that I'm all willing oh. to sell. Is the mm. Versus up on and the block? And then Jim, Jim, you want to list yours? Uh, FZ6, I got the FZ6 for sale, and I think that's it. Do I have anything else? 
And all these bikes, we've got them all um, up to date, fixed anything that needed to be fixed, right? Oh, yeah, sorted out. Yeah. So everything is sorted on them, good right. bikes. I'm guessing, by the way, Jim, that the FC1 is running good. Yes, I did put the FC1 through the, its paces uh, since I got it back from Emma. Gosh, it's been like six weeks ago. I just yeah. haven't been riding. I've been riding dirt all the time and not commuting to work nearly as much. So, uh, yeah. And is yeah, it, to go is through it the back hills. to running like a train? It runs like a rake tape, as some might say. That thing just rips. It's funny, but in the Santa Cruz Mountains, I spend most of my time in first and second gear. Yeah, well, but I mean, it's tall rips. gearing. You've got 160 horsepower. You don't need many more. Yeah, fun bike. But yeah, it ran like a Swiss watch. Great. And, uh, Thank you, darling. Thanks again to Todd Huffman, our guest, coming on today. Yeah. Sharing the story he of was the great. Um, yeah, I'm going to – we've got so many great films in the – Black Hills Moto Film Fest. We're going to have three nights of films curated. Um, so I'm, I'm going to get some more people lined up to come in and talk about their films. By the way, did you guys notice, remember a couple weeks ago we were talking about the Indonesian custom vessel? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. The tree scooter. C CNN. Yep. Did a piece on that movie. Yep. I'm just saying. Um, hello, CNN journalist, if you're listening. Yeah, you scooped them by like two weeks. <laughs> Exactly. So for so, everything that's scoopy in the motorcycle industry, you heard it. You heard it here first. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, you heard it. Thank you. I think we should say, so I might say that. Yeah, All right, Tim, and you and I got one more <laughs> week to go before we have to head out on our trip. I know. It's going to happen. It's happening. I know. I'm it has happened. I, get, I'm, I'm get, I made a list today. So to make uh, a list. Final Did message. Did you check it twice? I know beef jerky. That's all it says. Beef jerky and whiskey. Final message. Thank you to our Patreon subscribers. You guys are still coming through for us. I appreciate it so much. And um, lastly, I'm going to say be safe. I know it's summer. I know there's a lot of, you know, people going to the beach, people having parties, doing this and that. Be safe. Yes. Go ride. It's, yes. It's, it's safe. Yes. From COVID. Yes. Um, be Stay careful. away from those dirty humans. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Exactly. And uh, thank you again, Emma, for all your help today at the garage. Oh, you're welcome. Well, and it's, you're going to be you're going to be at the garage next week, right? Yes. For the following week and the following week, who's going to be in charge, Liza? Knock. No, he's not. It's going to be me, which <laughs> That's means right. everyone has to do exactly what I say. <laughs> Bagel. <laughs> yeah, boy. <laughs> awesome so um just don't forget to go on down to motorcyclesandmisfits.com check out our website and you'll find links to all sorts of things including all of our back episodes going all the way back to right. episode uno and check out misfits mm -hmm. and motorcycles on the youtube on the tube of views yeah well the recycle santa cruz a youtube uh page and you will find our miss it's videos where Emma gets her bearings. Oh, yes. I lost my and bearings the and they spilled. My bearings spilled all over the table. But I. <laughs> that, was that, that, that was after the shocker, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, that was exactly. after the shocker. We did the shocker yes. and then my the bearings shocker. spilled all over the table. <laughs> so oh, I heard that that was uh, Spock's first uh, uh, thing, but then they went with uh, that. Really? Yeah, well, this one puts you to sleep. That one, <laughs> this one says hello. This one's a whole other thing. <laughs> All right, let's. All right, very good. Up. Thanks everyone for listening. This is Eliza. Emma, darling. Bagel. Scott. Make it gym, son. Hey, you're getting good at it. Let's get out of here. Cool, cool, cool. 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 All right, cool thanks, whip. guys. <laughs>